Hello, and welcome to Legal Bites. If you're new here, my name is Alita. I'm a lawyer licensed in California and DC. And on this channel, we explain the law one bite at a time. We don't give legal advice, but we do talk about how the law works and try to look into our crystal ball to see how things might turn out. If you're enjoying this on YouTube, we'd love it if you could like the video, subscribe to the channel, share it with friends, all the great YouTube stuff. And if you want to listen while out and about, we're now offering our live streams in podcast form where you can leave a rating and review. Links are in the description below, as well as to our clips channel where you can find some of the best clips taken from our live streams. Otherwise, if you want to catch me elsewhere, you can find me on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. And if you want to support the channel, you can do so on Locals, Patreon, or by becoming a YouTube member, or by buying some really awesome Legal Bites merch. Again, all links are in the description below. And with that said, let's get into it. All right, you guys. Hello, hello. I hope that everyone can hear me okay. For some reason, my earbuds were having an issue with hearing the the feed from the intro uh, coming into this. Hopefully, once I get started on, on the other stuff, that will change. Anyway, I'll figure it out. I think it's probably fine. So long as you guys can hear it, that's, that's important. Um, so, okay. Sorry about the delay. This is the, the court was, uh, they had some arguments that they had over last minute jury instruction issues. I thought they resolved all of those yesterday, but I guess they had some that they decided to, to hold over to today or some, one of the sides maybe had, uh, sort of brought up one of those arguments as like they thought it wasn't fully resolved, which is fine. Um, so they then took a, a recess, which I thought was going to be like five or 10 minutes from that point. I guess the recess was a bit longer anyway. So yeah, we are definitely more delayed this morning than we usually are in the morning. So far, this trial has, has started actually early, if anything, um, in the mornings. So, um, anyway, uh, so we're going to get started, but first off, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, hope you guys are having a great Wednesday and got to get this before we, uh, before we get moving to uh, Jessica, thank you so much for gifting five Legal Bites memberships. Very, very kind and generous of you. And I know you've gifted a bunch in the past too. So thank you, thank you. So um, I wrote this down the G slide Karen Murray, King Harry, Digital Dictator, and Linda Coy. You've all been gifted memberships by Jessica. Um, so welcome or welcome back to Bike Club. Very happy to have you guys here. All right, folks, let's get into it, shall we? I will say I don't like that she's chewing right, gum. Be seated. Good morning, jurors. Thank you so much for your patience. All right, next witness. Chewing gum in court is not the best thing. Jeremy yeah, called PJ Pesh. Okay, so Fel Reed is not testifying, it looks like. So PJ Pesh is one of their experts. I do know that. Do you swear firm under penalty of law that the testimony you'll give in this case will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. All right. Have a seat. Talk into the microphone. Thank you. Good morning, sir. And you please tell the jury your full name. Uh, it's Paul Peter Pesh, Jr., but uh, I've always been referred to as P.J. Pesh. Mr. Pesh, what do you do for a living? Uh, I direct and write movies and television. How long have you been in the business of directing and writing movies and television? Uh, 35 years. Can you give the jury a background on your uh, movies that you've directed and kind of a biographical sketch? Sure. Uh, I attended Columbia University uh, and studied under Martin Scorsese and did a short film that traveled around the world. I wound up getting a deal at Paramount in 1990. Um, I directed a film for Roger Corman in 1991. Boosted the sound for you That guys. I wrote and directed in 1995. I directed a Western with Sam Elliott that we actually shot at Bonanza Creek Ranch. Um, 
that was a also rather lower budgeted short schedule. Uh, I've directed six feature films and close to a hundred hours of television. Um, I've created television shows, um, written and sold movie scripts. Um, I've worked for Paramount, uh, Warner Brothers, HBO, Universal, Fox. Anything else? I, I So just so you guys know, I mean, I, I know that at this point, there have been so many resumes that we've gone through, and especially the, the firearms expert at the end of the day yesterday, he went through a very, very long resume, even though he said that was the short version. The reason for it is because these are, these are experts that are testifying. And so in order to to properly offer them as experts. They've got to go through their experience. They've got to go through. I mean, even though the, the other side has already decided, you know, whether they will or won't allow this person to be an expert, uh, whether they will or won't, you know, object to them being an expert because they've, they've discussed all of these people before. Um, it, this is more for the jury so that the jury can, can c determine how much they should trust this person. So it does seem kind of boring, of course, but, um, um, it's, it, 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 there is a purpose to it and it, it is important. Also ZND fifth. Thanks so much for gifting 10 legal bites memberships. Very kind and generous of you. Um, so let's see here. Judy Baz ADS, Steven Yarger, Heather Price, uh, Richard Meadows, Crystal Harris, Sweetie Pie B and John Long. You have all been gifted memberships by ZND fifth. So, uh, thank you so much. Very, very kind and generous. And it looks like we've got a, we've got a gifting train started today. <laughs> That's great. Um, okay. Let's get back to the testimony. I just wanted to add that little bit. That's, um, a really good background. And I, I just want to ask you with regard, uh, to the Western on Bonanza Creek. That's also the site of, of where rust was found. Is that right? That's what I understand. Well, Mr. Pesh, um, it sounds like you have experience also with uh, movies involving firearms. Yes. Um, many of the television shows and I think four or five of the six films, two of them were Westerns. Uh, one of them was one of the Sniper series with Tom Berenger. Uh, one of them was uh, Smoke and Aces, which had a considerable amount of gunfire. In your uh, work on the movies involving uh, gunfire, have you had the occasion to work with armors and prop masters? I have. And actually in all of the movies you've done, I'm sure I'm certain you've worked with prop masters. Yes. Okay, sir. And, and with regard to those movies that you've directed in television, have you worked with uh, directors, first assistant directors and understood people's roles on the set? I have. Okay. With regard to armors, have you ever worked on a prior film in which an armor had split duties as an armor and a props? I have not. With regard to uh, this situation where there is a, a gun heavy set, I will represent to you. Would you think in your experience and what you've seen, it would be advisable to have a part-time armor doing two jobs? I would say that would be highly inadvisable. Whose responsibility is it to properly staff with regard to the movie functions? Uh, the line producer or the, the unit production manager. This is interesting because he's, he's getting into his opinions on this, but he, he hasn't actually like told the court that he wants this person to be an expert. So I'm wondering if maybe that means that, that he was not able to get him in as an expert. So I, this is going to be interesting. When you have a set involving upwards of 20 firearms, would it be in your experience possible for a part-time armor to manage that? I wouldn't imagine. So, um, one person can each one of those weapons needs to be tracked pretty consistently for the set to remain safe so i don't see how a single person can keep their eye on 20 firearms 
With regard to overall set safety and your experience and background, who is in charge of that? The first AD is considered in all of the published safety advisories, uh, the chief safety officer on the set. Are you a member of various guilds? I'm a member of the Writers Guild, the Directors Guild, SAG-AFTRA, which is the Actors Guild, and I also happen to be a member of the Musicians Guild. Okay, so when you talk about safety rules, uh, are some of those from those guilds? Yes, there's a, I can't remember the name of the organization, but they sort of uh, collectively represent all of the various guilds and issue recommendations for safety uh, that they recommend uh, attaching to the call sheet each day. Is it, in your experience, also um, something you've seen where there will be daily safety meetings on set, especially in a gun-heavy set? Expert. Uh, yes, Your Honor. We, I believe he can give lay opinions on his experience, but, but also we would tender him as an expert. I, I think we should approach. Okay. So now, so yeah, the, I was I was confused at the start because usually what happens is they go through the experience and then and then they say like, okay, I, I would like to tender this witness as an expert, and then the, the other side either says no objection or they say, you know, your enemy we approach, and they have have a sidebar, not a sidebar. Um, but here he just he kind of just like blew right past that and went right into his opinions. So it sounds like the state objected to him being a, an expert witness here. And so he's trying to toe the line on what's a lay opinion. So Mr. Pesh, you were discussing some of those safety rules now. Would it be, in your experience, advisable for... Uh, okay, so we still don't know if he's been properly admitted as an expert witness, but something tells me he probably was not. And so he's... It, lay Opinion testimony is, generally speaking, not okay for for any lay witness so this is this is very this is very strange there's been a bit of that in this trial also from the state's witnesses they're there you know from all of the other um crew members that were testifying as to their opinion on like based on their experience it's very it's very strange to me that they've been allowing that in this case um so i guess i guess we're gonna we're gonna allow it here too production to convene daily safety meetings Yes, in fact, it's recommended by all of the published literature uh, by the guilds. Um, and it's been my, they, they recommend that a safety meeting takes place anytime uh, there's to be any stunts, firearms, special effects. But it's been my experience, but in the last seven or eight years since the tragic incident with the camera assistant who was killed on the railroad bridge that every first AD I've worked with, regardless of what's happening that day on the call sheet, has a quick safety meeting just running over and reiterating basic safe practices. And, and you as a uh, director, uh, is that something that you advise and you practice? I don't give safety meetings. That's the job of the first safety AD. officer, the first AD, but I think it's a great idea. In your experience and in, in interacting with first assistant directors, if, for example, there's a situation where a set is rushing, there's safety issues occurring, does the first assistant director have any responsibility in that respect? Most definitely. And what would that be in your experience? What would what would you expect to see happen? Um, my experience has been that the first has an announcement to everybody, slow down, this is not safe, or we're not doing this, or just takes charge. And uh, if there's a specific issue with a crew member, they'll pull them aside and discuss the issue and consult 
with stunts or props or uh, firearms and deal with it. Is that also true, for example, if you have a issue with an actor, uh, for example, uh, firing a blank after somebody yells cut, what would the first AD be expected to do in your experience? Uh, speak with them and indicate, look, when cut is called, uh, usually the only person that can call cut is the director. But if, if it's a safety issue, anybody can call cut. And once cut is called, everything needs to stop. Because if there is a safety issue, obviously, that somebody has noticed, nothing else should take place. So, yes, the first AD should speak to that performer. When it comes to safety, what is your view as to everybody's responsibility on set? Well, again, it's not just my view, but again, in the published literature of the of the various guilds, they indicate safety is everyone's responsibility. If there's a safety issue, there are anonymous hotlines for anybody to call and raise these issues. And are those uh, anonymous hotlines, are those published generally in your experience working on set? They are. Usually they're uh with that safety recommendations that are attached to the call sheet. And those hotlines, uh, what do they, what do they provide for people to be able to do if they notice a safety failure? Uh, you can call the, someone from your guild. Uh, each of the studios has their own separate hotline. Um, uh, and as far as I know, that will allow you to anonymously, so you don't, look, if you report something, you could put your career in jeopardy. Nobody wants to do that. But um, the idea is that a representative can provide that information to somebody who will take action, such as the producer, the UPM or the first AD. In your experience, uh, have you worked and seen the interaction between prop masters and armors? I have. And can you tell the jury in your experience generally how they interact, uh, who's in charge of the firearms and who's in charge of the ammunition and then what the prop master role is? Well, the prop master more often than not hires the armorer because that's a subset of that department. But the armor is in charge of all ammunition, all firearms, um, maintaining them, uh, keeping them safe, and inventorying the ammunition. With those duties and responsibilities, would you believe it to be important in your experience to accord the armor adequate time to do those duties? Yes. And would it be important to accord adequate resources uh, for that armor to do those duties? Yes. If there is a scenario where the um, armor is dealing with uh, a gun heavy set, not having those resources, who would you expect to assist that, that armor in getting those? Props. If there is a situation where um, there is a scene, a video, something's happening, and both the armor and first assistant director witness a, a safety violation involving a, a weapon, for example, um, what would be your assessment whether one or both of them um, should say something about that? I would say both of them should say something about it and figure out why it happened and uh, make sure it doesn't happen again. Okay. 
Thank you, Your Honor. I have no further questions. That did nothing to move the needle. Cross exam. I expect this to be disrespectful AF. Mr. Pesh, I just have a couple follow up questions for you. Thank you for your time today. Certainly. Um, so, anyone on the crew can stop filming due to safety concerns. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. And that includes Ms. Gutierrez. Oh, that's correct. Yep. She's, she's going to um, use that. And, sir, did you read or watch the statements of Ms. Gutierrez in preparation for your testimony? I did not. That was my understanding. Um, so are you aware that on October 21st, 2021, um, Ms. Gutierrez was not inside the church with the gun, not because she was working on props, but because she was just doing some other armor or duties. Objection, Your Honor. Maybe misstating the testimony. So her to her tone is, is better than I expected it to be. The reason why I went into cross-examination thinking that she was going to be disrespectful AF is because of kind of how she talked about him in the in the final hearing. Um, that she was like, he's this Hollywood guy that's supposed to be some kind of an expert and had that total spicy tone that she has shown at times during this trial. Um, that entire hearing was incredibly spicy. Um, so, so anyhow, but her tone so far has been, has been all right. Um, interesting that, you know, she, she asked him about the, 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 uh, the interview that she had with the police that, that Hannah had with the police. It, it's an interesting thing because now that he's not an expert, you know, how, how much, how much can he have, have, you know, looked at he can't he can't testify to it because he's not an expert that's for sure do i need to restate the question do you yes. remember yes okay. please uh so my question for you is uh we we saw some some uh interviews from ms gutierrez and and she does uh explain that she was not in the church because she was um preparing her fanny pack and her blank ammunition for the next scene you agree that that's sounds like armor work to, to, to you, not props work. Yes. Okay. Um, and are you also aware, sir, that on the morning of the 21st, when the crew was waiting for replacement camera personnel to arrive, Ms. Gutierrez had approximately three hours uh, to work on her preparation for the scenes that day? I was not aware of that. Okay. Thank you. I'll pass the witness. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. She came in, she just, she just like, just did a drive by, got every single point that she needed, got in, got out, like direct questions, direct hit on every single one. That was a good cross. That was a really good cross. So for those of you that, that think that, that I, uh, <laughs> that think that I, I, I have this impression of, of Miss Carrie Morrissey, that she, she can do nothing right. She absolutely did this cross examination, right? She did. Um, I, I, I will say that there's a lot that I don't like about her. There's, there are things that I do like about her. Um, and that cross-examination was a very good example of, of, of good Car Carrie Morrissey right there. Um, ZND fifth, thank you so much for gifting 20 more Legal Bites memberships. Very kind and generous of you. Holy cow. So let's go through these fed coin, uh, uh, stipulated fat cat, rattlesnake, Mark Mullins, Kyle Mulkey, alias Kurt Bradwell, uh, Ida Smestad, Love Your Life, Jamie Bruce, NJI Pep, uh, Sir Kajambo, Kristen O, Slam Dunk Funketeer, Shy Town Native, Taylor M, Marco Munari, Cyber Matt Strikes, Mary Louise Milbrook, Lara K. Uh, and I think that's it. You have all been gifted memberships by ZND fifth. So welcome or welcome back to bike club. So happy to have you guys here. Uh, and, uh, thank you once again for that very kind and generous gift. Redirect. Just, all right. Redirect. Uh, very briefly, all right. Okay. Mr. Petsch, if there was, um, a scene going on inside the church at that time involving Mr. Baldwin and the firearm, if Miss Gutierrez Reed was not in the church, would you have expected someone to have called her back in? I would. If there's a firearm on set, there should be an armor on set. Nothing further, Your Honor. All right. Thank you. 
you're excused. Thank mm -hmm. you. Okay. So that last witness approach. basically did nothing for the defense to really hear. I mean, I, I feel like at this point, now that it seems that that's been all of the witnesses, I can probably sum up the defense's case as, and the defense also tried, right? Like they tried, they put on, they put on a case, they put on, you know, a, a theory their, their opening statement was actually better than, than the state's opening statement, way better in my opinion. Um, but it's just sometimes when you get a turd case, the best you can do is polish a turd and you're still a turd, right? Um, not to say that, that the defense has done a perfect job of this case at all, by any means, they've made a lot of, a lot of mistakes, a lot of really bad mistakes. Um, but I think, um, I mean, the biggest issues here is not the lawyering. It's, it's the facts of the case. It's the interview that she did with the police interviews, both of them. Next witness. Oh. At this time, the defense rest. Okay. Okay, thank you. All right, so both sides have rested. It's now my duty to give you the instructions of law. Okay. I'm going to read them to you, and then you will get a copy of the instructions, okay? Yeah. The instructions. So she's going to read them, then give them a copy, she just said. And uh, I'm going to get some questions here before we get into that. Oh, and also, just because, thank you so much for the super chat. Could Bowles have objected to Morrissey's testifying in her question? He did at first, but then I think that he ended up maybe losing that objection, and she basically got to ask the question again. So it, it, he objected. We don't know exactly what he objected, but I figured it was maybe either misstating the testimony or attorney testifying. So yeah, it's, it's, he, he would, was not able to get away with, uh, a lot of that, um, because she was always objecting and he tended to lose on those. Um, and wants to know how do deliberations, jury deliberations work? Well, so there's going to be jury instructions that'll be read to them. They'll get a copy of it. Then they'll get closing arguments. Then after that, the jury's going to go into the jury deliberation room where it's just them. There'll be a bailiff outside. They have questions. They can write a note for the judge and then the judge can call them in and, and answer, et cetera, et cetera. But basically it's up to them to decide how they want to go about it. No one can, can give them any sort of like rules on, on what they have to do in order to to uh to properly deliberate on this other than the jury instructions like that's the only bit of instructions that they get otherwise it's kind of up to their discretion to figure it out how they want to go about it um dave Beatty, if they are discussing reducing charges how does that affect the trial overall they were not dis uh, uh, discussing reducing charges here they were talking about the the actual jury instructions which we're going to hear right now um it, it's just like the the like certain definitions here and there, which word are they going to use? Are they going to use negligence? Are they going to use recklessness? Very important things. But the the charges themselves are still going to be the same um, at, at this stage. Baz 80s. Um, why is the defense all about blaming others instead of trying to prove innocence? That is that a good strategy? I think that it's just the best strategy that they possibly had here. And I think a lot of that probably had to do with um, Hannah's Hannah's interviews with the police where she admitted to a lot, a lot of things. All right. Uh, stipulated fat cat. Um, if the defense wants him as an expert, does that mean he has gone over past testimony? So if he can't be qualified, then would he be dismissed? Um, so that's a very, con a very interesting thing. So usually they're going to be, there's going to be a, a determination ahead of time as to whether someone's going to be a, uh, an expert or not designated as an expert or not. Like you'll, you'll know ahead of time if there's any chance of them not being uh, admitted as, as an expert or, or, or accepted as an expert. Um, the, be the better alternative is for them to not, not watch the testimony. Um, so yeah, LK Ryden um, almost seemed like defense doesn't want him as an expert. If he is admitted, could he be both normal witness and expert at once? No, he's either going to be. So the default is any witness that comes in and, and goes on the stand. The default is they are a, a lay witness until they've been properly admitted as an expert witness properly you know they, they, they they've laid the groundwork they've been tendered and then they've been accepted as an expert then then they can testify as to opinions on things uh the g slide were you able to inquire about the defense team's prior experience in criminal litigation yeah that the website seemed to be down when i was looking at it i don't know if maybe they were just had too many people looking at it and it crashed um but i i can i'll check again 
Um, and also, thank you so much for the super chat. Uh, J.A. Buzan? J.A. Buzan? I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing that. I feel like some of the interviews being bad for Hannah were due to bad lawyering. Also love the live streams. Thanks. Yeah, no problem. Thank you so much. Um, I mean, yes. Yeah. At least for the, the second interview anyway, he was right there in the room with her after all. Right. Um, but the first one, she didn't have counsel and she decided to talk to the police anyway, which is a terrible idea. Terrible idea. All right, folks. Um, okay. I think that's about it. Let's get to the jury instructions. Instructions I'm giving you are very helpful for the, um, counsel to, uh, use in their closing arguments. Okay. Which will follow. All right, so instruction number one, you have heard all the evidence. It is now my duty to tell you the law that you must follow in this case. Instruction number two, the law governing this case is contained in instructions that I'm about to give you. It is your duty to follow the law as contained in these instructions. You must consider these instructions as a whole. You must not pick out one instruction or parts of an instruction and disregard others. A copy of these instructions will be given to you when you begin your deliberations. Instruction number three, the law presumes the defendant to be innocent unless and until you are satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt of her guilt, his or her guilt. The burden is always on the state to prove guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. It is not required that the state prove guilt beyond all possible doubt. The test is one of reasonable doubt. A reasonable doubt is a doubt based upon reason and common sense, the kind of doubt that would make a reasonable person hesitate to act in the graver and more important affairs of life. Instruction number four, you are the sole judges of the facts in this case. It is your duty to determine the facts from the evidence produced here in court. Your verdict should not be based on speculation, guess, or conjecture. Neither sympathy nor prejudice should influence your verdict. You are to apply the law as stated in these instructions to the facts as you find them, and in this way, decide the case. Instruction number five, your verdict must represent the considered judgment of each juror. In order to return a verdict, it is necessary that each juror agrees. Your verdict must be unanimous. It is your duty to consult with one another and try to reach an agreement. However, you are not required to give up your individual judgment. Each of you must decide the case for yourself, but you must do so only after an impartial consideration of the evidence with your fellow jurors. In the course of your deliberations, do not hesitate to re-examine your own view and change your opinion if you are convinced it is erroneous, but do not surrender your honest conviction as to the weight or effective evidence solely because of the opinion of your fellow jurors or for the purpose of reaching the uh, verdict. You are the judges, judges of the facts. Your sole interest is to ascertain the truth from the evidence in this case. Instruction number six, each crime charged in the information should be considered separately. Instruction number seven, you must not concern yourself with the consequences of your verdict. Instruction number eight, you must not draw any inference of guilt from the fact that the defendant did not testify in this case, nor should this fact be discussed by you or enter into your deliberations in any way. Very important. Instruction number nine, you alone are the judges of the credibility of the witnesses and the weight to be given to the testimony of each of them. In determining the credit to be given any witness, you should take into account the witness's truthfulness or untruthfulness, ability and opportunity to observe, memory, manner while testifying, any interest, bias, or prejudice the witness may have, and the reasonableness of the witness's testimony considered in light of all of the evidence in the case. Instruction number 10. You should consider each opinion received in evidence in this case and give it such weight you think it deserves. If you should conclude that the reason given in support of the opinion the reasons given in support of the opinion are not sound or that for any other reason an opinion is not correct, you may disregard the opinion entirely. Instruction. Really quick, uh, Janae Doherty, thanks so much for becoming a YouTube member. Welcome to Bike Club. Number 11. An expert witness is a witness who, by knowledge, skill, experience, training, or education, has become expert in any subject. 
An expert witness may be permitted to state an opinion as to that subject. You should consider each expert opinion and the reasons stated for the opinion, giving them such weight as you think they deserve. You may reject an opinion entirely if you conclude that it is unsound. Instruction number 12. For you to find the defendant guilty of involuntary manslaughter as charged in count one, the state must prove to your satisfaction beyond a reasonable doubt each of the following elements of the crime. One, Hannah Gutierrez endangered the safety of another by handling or using a firearm in a negligent manner. Two, Hannah Gutierrez should have known of the danger involved by Hannah Gutierrez's actions. Action three, Hannah Gutierrez acted with a willful disregard for the safety of others. Four, Hannah Gutierrez's act caused the death of Helena Hutchins. Five, this happened in New Mexico on or about the 21st day of October, 2021. Ah, so that first one actually is a recklessness, um, recklessness definition there. So, so this is, so that, that first alternative charge is she had to have, have known of the danger that she was, that she was causing and have willfully disregarded it. That is recklessness. So that's interesting. Instruction 12A. For you to find the defendant guilty of involuntary manslaughter in count one alternative, the state must prove to your satisfaction beyond a reasonable doubt each of the following elements of the crime. One, Hannah Gutierrez loaded live ammunition into a firearm intended to contain only inert ammunition and or Hannah Gutierrez failed to perform an adequate safety check of the ammunition she loaded into the firearm. Two, Hannah Gutierrez should have known of the danger involved by Hannah Gutierrez's action. Three, Hannah Gutierrez acted with a willful disregard for the safety of others. Four, Hannah Gutierrez's act caused the death of Helena Hutchins. Five, this happened in New Mexico on or about the 21st day of October, 2021. Instruction number 13. For you to define, for you so, to. So, once again, sorry, I, both of those actually require a recklessness uh, um, element, which I was under the impression that they were going with negligence. So, that's very, very interesting to me. Um, for me, my it doesn't change my personal opinion on this, um, but it might for other people. Find the defendant guilty of neg negligent use of a deadly weapon as a lesser included offense charged in count. One, the state must prove to your satisfaction beyond a reasonable doubt each of the following elements of the crime. One, the defendant endangered the safety of another by handling or using a firearm in a negligent manner. Two, this happened in New Mexico on or about the 21st day of October, 2021. Instruction number 13A, for you to find the defendant acted negligently in this case, you must find that the defendant acted with willful disregard of the rights or safety of others and in a manner which endangered any person or property. Instruction 13b. In addition to the other elements of tampering with evidence, the state must prove to your satisfaction beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant acted intentionally when she committed the crime. A person acts intentionally when she purposely does an act which the law declares to be a crime. Whether the defendant acted intentionally may be inferred from all of the surrounding circumstances, such as the manner in which she acts, the means used, or her conduct. Instruction number 14. You have been instructed on the crimes of involuntary manslaughter and the lesser included offense of negligent use of a firearm as charged in count one. It is up to you, the jury, to choose the manner and order in which you deliberate on the crimes charged in that count. However, to return a verdict, you must follow the procedure described in the next instruction. Instruction number 15. To aid you in your deliberations and in returning your verdict, you will be provided both guilty and not guilty forms for each of the charges for each of the crimes charged in count one. Unless you unanimously agree on a verdict, you should not sign a verdict form for that crime. Although you may deliberate on the crimes charged in count one in any manner and order which you choose, you must return your verdicts for each offense in count one in the order they are instructed. 
under this procedure if you unanimously find the defendant guilty of involuntary manslaughter you should sign the guilty form for that offense and should not proceed to reach a verdict on the remaining offense in count one if after reasonable deliberation you do not reach a unanimous verdict on involuntary manslaughter you should not sign a verdict form for that offense and should not proceed to reach a verdict on the remaining offense you should only return a verdict on negligent use of a firearm if you unanimously find the defendant not guilty of involuntary manslaughter. If you unanimously find the defendant not guilty of involuntary manslaughter, you must sign the not guilty verdict form for involuntary manslaughter before returning a verdict on any other crime charge in count one. If you unanimously find the defendant guilty of negligent use of a firearm, you should sign the guilty verdict for that offense. If you do not reach a unanimous verdict on negligent use of a firearm, you should not sign a verdict form for that offense. Instruction number 16. In this case, as to the charge of involuntary manslaughter contained in count one, there are four possible verdicts. One, guilty of involuntary manslaughter. Two, not guilty of involuntary manslaughter. Three, guilty of negligent use of a firearm. Four, not guilty of negligent use of a firearm. You must consider each of these crimes. You should be sure that you fully understand the elements of each crime before you deliberate further. You have the discretion to choose the manner and order in which you deliberate on this count, but you must return a unanimous verdict of not guilty on involuntary manslaughter before entering a verdict on negligent use of a firearm. You will first decide whether the defendant is guilty of the crime of involuntary manslaughter. If you unanimously find the defendant guilty of involuntary manslaughter, then that is the only form of verdict which is to be signed as to this count. If okay, so did you guys understand that? So, so the count of involuntary manslaughter has a lesser included count of negligent use of a firearm that they are that they are also charging here, which is interesting. Um, so they only get to negligent use of a firearm if they if they decide not guilty on the first on involuntary manslaughter if they say she's not guilty on those then they get to you know did she, you know did she negligently uh use 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 a firearm here and and cause harm etc cetera, etc cetera. so um but if they if they find her guilty on that first one on involuntary manslaughter they don't even look at um negligent use of a firearm because it's kind of assumed that there was a negligent use of a firearm if they found her guilty of the first one. If you unanimously find the defendant not guilty of involuntary manslaughter, then you should sign only the not guilty form as to involuntary manslaughter. If after reasonable deliberation, you do not reach a unanimous verdict on involuntary manslaughter, you should not sign a verdict form for that crime and you should not proceed to reach a verdict on the remaining crime. If you unanimously find the defendant not guilty of involuntary manslaughter, you will then go on to a consideration of the crime of negligent use of a firearm. If you unanimously find the defendant guilty of negligent use of a firearm, then that is the only form of verdict which should be signed. But if you unanimously find the defendant not guilty of the crime of negligent use of a firearm, then you should sign only the not guilty form. If after reasonable deliberation, you do not reach a unanimous verdict on negligent use of a firearm, you should not sign a verdict form for that crime. You may not find the defendant guilty of more than one of the foregoing crimes. If you have a reasonable doubt as to whether the defendant has committed any one of the crimes, you must determine that the defendant is not guilty of that crime. If you find the defendant not guilty of all of these crimes in count one, you must return a verdict of not guilty as for this count. Instruction number 17, for you to find the defendant guilty of tampering with evidence as charged in count two, the state must prove to your satisfaction beyond a reasonable doubt each of the following elements of the crime. One, the defendant Hannah Gutierrez had a baggie of cocaine by asking Rebecca Smith to take it outside of Hannah Gutierrez's hotel or hid a baggie of cocaine by asking Rebecca Smith to take it outside of Hannah Gutierrez's hotel room. Two, by doing so, the defendant intended to prevent the apprehension, prosecution, or conviction of Hannah Gutierrez for the crime of involuntary manslaughter. Three, this happened in New Mexico on or about the 21st day of October, 2021. 
Instruction number 18. A firearm means any weapon which will or is designed to or may readily be converted to expel a projectile by the actions of an explosion. The frame or receiver of a firearm, any firearm muffler or firearm silencer. Firearm includes any handgun, rifle, or shotgun. Instruction number 19. In addition to the other elements of the crime of involuntary manslaughter as set, in for, as set forth in instruction number 12a, the state must prove to your satisfaction beyond a reasonable doubt, doubt that, one, the death was a foreseeable result of Hannah Gutierrez placing a live round into a firearm intended to contain only inert ammunition and or Hannah Gutierrez's failure to perform an adequate safety check of the ammunition she loaded into the firearm. Two, the act of the defendant was a significant cause of the death of Helena Hutchins. The defendant's act was a significant cause of death if it was an act which, in a natural and continuous chain of events, uninterrupted by an outside events, resulted in the death and without which the death would have not occurred. There may be more than one significant cause of death. If the acts of two or more persons significantly contribute to the cause of death, each act is a significant cause of death. Instruction number 20. The state must prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant's act was a significant cause of the death of Helena Hutchins. An issue in this case is whether the negligence of a person other than the defendant may have contributed to the cause of death. Such contributing negligence does not relieve the defendant of responsibility for an act that significantly contributed to the cause of death so long as the death was a foreseeable result of the defendant's actions. Yep. However, if you find the negligence of a person other than the defendant was the only significant cause of death, or constitutes an intervening cause that breaks the foreseeable chain of events, then the defendant is not guilty of the offense of involuntary manslaughter. Instruction number 21, now the lawyers will argue the case. What is said in, in the closing arguments is not evidence. It is an opportunity for the lawyers to discuss the evidence and the law as I have instructed you. The state has the right to argue first, the defense may then argue, and the state may then reply. Council. Okay. Really quick before we hear uh, closing arguments, we've got a few questions and comments that I wanted to address. Um, and yeah, we'll do another poll after closing arguments because I want to see if there's a significant change uh, in what people think after closing. Uh, Link journey. Whenever you're being interviewed by the police, repeat after me. I want a lawyer and I, <laughs> and I exercise my right to be silent. Uh, something Hannah didn't do and is going to cost her, right? Legal bites. Yes. Agreed. And, and, don't equivocate. Don't ask them if if you need it. Just say, I am not talking until I have a lawyer present. Boom. That's it. Sit back, fold your arms, get comfortable. <laughs> um, that's that's what you need to do. Uh, not legal advice, but just general life advice. Nomad Purple. Doesn't the U.S. have jury nullifications that can ignore any parts of the law they choose to? Technically, it's not. They're not supposed to, and they can't be instructed on it. Soluble hamster shouldn't jury instructions take place after closing arguments? Not necessarily. I've seen it done both ways uh, before and after. I actually prefer jury instructions before closing arguments because the jury is still anticipating that they're going to hear closing arguments. And so after closing arguments, there's a tendency to maybe check out a little bit. So you, I mean, you just, it's important for them to hear it. Although um, it's, it's not so much to make sure that they absorb every single little bit and remember every single little bit that they heard from the jury instructions. It's to make sure that the the court can sufficiently say, yes, every single juror has been has been made aware of these instructions. They've gone through them because once they go into the jury deliberation room, like they can't monitor them to be like, well, are you actually using the jury instructions? So this is a way to to sort of have a little bit of a safeguard to say, okay, all of the jurors have had uh, exposure to, to the jury instructions. Um, Nick Wilson, what's the difference between reckless and negligence, recklessness and negligence. So, so negligence is you had a duty to do something or a duty not to do something. And you, and you breached that duty. Um, you did something that, that, you know, you, you either did something you weren't supposed to do, or you didn't do something when you were supposed to do it. That's negligence. Recklessness is I know that what I'm doing right now is going is has a high likelihood of of causing someone great harm, great bodily harm, and I'm 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 
I'm consciously aware of it and I am intentionally deciding to to continue with this behavior. That's what recklessness is. It's it's you know being blackout or I don't know about blackout but being absolutely blitzed and deciding to get into a car and driving 100 miles an hour down the freeway. Like that's the, you know that could be considered recklessness, right? Because somebody knows that that's a bad behavior um going into it. Um especially if they are made consciously aware of of what they're doing. Um and uh, question can the jury determine guilty of the manslaughter and not guilty for evidence tampering or both charges have to be the same no those are two separate charges they can decide either way on either one of those so they could say guilty on on manslaughter innocent or not guilty on um on on evidence tampering or vice versa matthias wickman uh it, who is winning this <laughs> the state or the defense at the moment uh that's up to the jury to be honest with you um i don't know uh, the Lucian, honestly, by specifying it as cocaine, that might help help HGR jury can just go. We have no evidence of what it truly was. And that was a big fight yesterday over the jury instructions. Defense real defense wanted to keep it as cocaine. Um, the prosecution wanted to have a more generalized, um, phrase of like, you know, a suspected controlled substance. That's what they wanted, which would have been a lot easier for them to, to, to prove, right? Because it's like, okay, suspected controlled substance. But the judge said, no, uh, -uh you, you're not going to, you're not going to go with that. It, it's got to be cocaine. This is, this is what you guys said it was, you know, this is, you've got to have proved it. Um, Puel and Ivis, thanks for the super chat. I'm so confused. Case law and voluntary manslaughter by lawful act is clearly negligence. Um, this is what the court has decided based on the case law. I, I, I did see from the tweets yesterday that they had pulled a couple cases, one that the defense requested and one that, that the state had requested. Um, and I didn't, I, I haven't looked at, at the case law on that, but, um, but I, I don't know. I, I, this is what the judge decided based on the case law. So I'm not sure. Um, all righty. Okay, folks. Let's get to it. Buckle up. Closing arguments. Here we go. Exactly, Nico. Hold on to your butts. <laughs> okay, thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. May it please the court, counsel. Um, I want to begin by thanking you all for your time. I know that this has been a, a long trial and um, I also understand that as jurors, you find yourselves maybe a little frustrated. There's a lot of sitting around and waiting. Um, and uh, we appreciate your time. We appreciate the sacrifice that you make when you leave your jobs and your families and your other responsibilities. And you come to court uh, to participate in a very, very important part of our justice system. So on behalf of the state of New Mexico, uh, we thank you very much for your time. And as you can see on your screens, we end exactly where we began, in the pursuit of justice for Helena Hutchins. I want to start by just generally outlining Hannah Gutierrez failed to maintain firearm safety, making a fatal accident willful and foreseeable. And please keep in mind that omissions can also be willful. So if we fail to do something that we should do and that failure uh, results in someone's death, then that too uh, can be willful. So I would ask that you keep that in mind as we move through uh, some of the evidence and testimony that you have heard. I know that you have heard a lot and I do not intend to keep you too long, uh, but I do have to be thorough. I do want to hit 
uh, some high points. So I do appreciate your patience. Um, here's what. Sorry, one thing that I forgot to mention is closing arguments. Here is all about arming the people on the jury who are who are on your team at this point because jurors have you know their thoughts on on this case at this point. So. This is all about arming the people who are potentially on your side with all of the best information so that they continue advocating for your side when they're in the jury deliberation room. So so right now, it's it, she's not necessarily going to be trying to reach the people who are maybe on the fence, maybe, you know, but not the people who are, you know, on on the defense side, if there is anyone. Her goal is is to communicate directly to like the 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 biggest supporters on the jury panel so that they can go and argue for the state when they go into de deliberations. Okay. Sorry. That was, that was the one thing that I, that I forgot to mention about this. So to, to keep that in mind as you watch. We saw these videos, if you recall, that were taken by production outfitters, they were taken on October 13th of 2021. What these demonstrate to you is that Ms. Gutierrez was unwilling to maintain proper firearm safety repeatedly. And it's really important because this is not a case where Hannah Gutierrez made one mistake and that one mistake was accidentally putting a live round into that gun. That's not what this case is about. This case is about constant, never-ending safety failures that resulted in the death of a human being and nearly killed another. So let's talk about all of the safety failures that we saw and the reason that these safety failures prior to October 21st are so critically important to the analysis is because they go to foreseeability. And foreseeability is a very important element in this case. So as we can see here, we have our um, stunt man with his double barrel shotgun. From watching those videos, what you understood is that Ms. Gutierrez did appear to in fact be present because at times we saw her and at times we heard her. So she wasn't off doing prop duties. She was right there and she never intervened. Gun pointed at a child. Gun pointed at Joel Souza directly at his back. Gun pointed up in the air in the direction of the stunt coordinator. Gun pointed again, apparently in the direction of Mr. Souza, the person on the far right. Gun pointed directly at Mr. Souza again, the firearm in the left hand of the stuntman who is facing you. Firearm pointed directly at a minor child. Firearm pointed directly at the camera. Yes. Ms. Gutierrez holding that same firearm with the muzzle pointed at her own face. Um, this was unexpected. Ms. Gutierrez stood by and did nothing in between scenes, when that stunt man, who had certainly been sent the message that he could do whatever he wanted with those guns, no one was going to intervene. The person tasked with intervening was not going to do it. That was clear. He hands the firearm to the child and allows the child to manipulate the gun before then after a short period of time, perhaps thinking better of it and taking the gun back. 
This firearm, I actually don't think in this photo that the firearm is pointed at the child. I think the firearm is based on the angle of the camera, probably more pointed at this person right here. Um, but she's there. We hear her, we see her, she does nothing. Absolutely nothing. This is some of the first evidence that we see where if something doesn't stop, if something doesn't change, she is moving in, in the direction of potentially a fatal incident. And that is exactly what happened. And I want you to recall Ms. Gutierrez's interview on November 9th when Ms. Gutierrez uh, spoke of the accidental discharge with the other stunt man. Um, having a complete lack of understanding of her role in safety on this movie set, she's talking about Sarah Zachary. And she was like, well, yours just went off in there after you loaded it. And I said, yeah, well, I can't be responsible for every dickhead fucking stunt guy that gets a hold of the gun and doesn't understand the concept that it's hot. <sighs> Her entire job is to be responsible for exactly that. And when she took this job, she agreed to that responsibility. There is no exception in the law for your young. The exception in the law does not exist. The law treats everyone the same. That's a good close. And it must. Her pacing is really great. What was the point to the testimony about the lever action rifle? Well, here's the point to the testimony about the lever action rifle. More negligence, more carelessness, more lack of attention to safety. She loaded a lever action rifle with dummy rounds that by the way, according to the director was completely unnecessary. Because yes, while it's true, this gun operates in a way where if a certain type of camera angle is hitting it, dummy rounds would be appropriate if the scene calls for loading or cycling. There wasn't a scene that called for that. So she just loaded a lever action rifle with dummy rounds and surprisingly, put the wrong caliber round in the gun. That is absolutely an example of someone who is not paying attention, not taking their job seriously. I wanna to talk to you a little bit about some of the rounds that you've seen because it's critical to tracking the existence of the live rounds on this movie set. And we have spent a lot of time and effort tracking those rounds around that movie set. And we're gonna show you that evidence right now. So the important thing to know is that the Seth Kenny dummies, which you are looking at right here, are patinaed. They are distinct. They have an antique coloring. They also have silver primers. These rounds did not come on that movie set until October 12th of 2021 because Mr. Kenny didn't have them. And if you recall his testimony, he was in Texas. So he had to get back, clean them up and provide them to Sarah Zachary. And that took place on October 12th. This is just simply the primer side of those rounds. You can see that they're dark in color on the primer side, and they do appear to have silver primers. This is a photograph of the 3840 dummies. If you recall Mr. Kenny's testimony, the 3840 dummies came from Billy Ray. 
And the important thing about this photograph is that none of those dummy rounds had silver primers. And silver primer is a very important piece of this puzzle. This is those same rounds on their side. You can see that they are shiny brass. We also know that they have brass primers. We just saw that. Uh, based on Mr. Kenny's testimony, you know that they were 3840, but there was also some 4440 caliber rounds um, in that box. Does that matter if they're not working? <laughs> no. Let's stop. Okay. Okay, with that pause, really quick, um, Preston, ridiculous. Thanks for the super chat. What sentence for evidence tampering and manslaughter? So each one is up to 18 months, max 18 months. I don't believe there's a minimum for either one. Uh, just because, thanks for the super chat. I can't take this part seriously because she legitimately said before the investigation doesn't really matter because we got it right in the end. Yeah, they kind of, I don't, I don't like that logic either. I really don't like that logic either. But the thing that, that kind of makes me just not really care about this part um, is, Hannah's own, her own, uh, uh, interview, the things that she said on her own. So, yeah. Uh, and then there are other questions that I will answer in a bit. Um, oh, except for this one, Benji, can opposing counsel object in any way if she's saying things that are misleading in closing arguments? Yes. Yes. But you want to be careful about objecting in, in closing arguments because, um, it, it can very, very easily backfire if you're wrong. But if you're right and you win on that objection, that can be very damaging to the other side. I've seen I've seen both things happen um, in, in trials. Thank you. Um, let's take a moment to talk about all this testimony that you've heard about whether or not the live rounds found at PDQ, which are photographed there on the left, match the live rounds found on the set of Rust. You don't have to be a gun expert to look at those and see they simply do not match. Even though you could look at those rounds and fundamentally understand that they are not the same, the police department, I'm sorry, sorry, the sheriff's department sent them to the FBI for testing so that we could actually have some experts confirm what we can see with our very own eyes. Yeah, I mean, I'm still not convinced by this what argument. What you have in evidence. But for me, it doesn't really matter for the conclusion. If you want to see them in, in real time, you have States Exhibit 79, you have States Exhibit 91. States Exhibit 79, is a disassembled live round from PDQ props. States Exhibit 79 is a disassembled live round from the set of rust. You can look at them, you can see the projectiles are different, you can see that uh, it, perhaps the primers are even, are, are even different. If you recall, uh, Ms. Popple indicated there were only 10 silver primered live rounds found at PDQ, the rest of them were brass. The other thing that you can just see with your eyes is the gunpowder in these is substantially different. It has a different chemical composition. So any argument that could ever be made in this case that Seth Kinney was the source of these live rounds is absolutely dishonest. Now, I'm gonna ask you to take a, take a walk in the weeds with me here, okay? This is a photograph of October 10th of 2021. You can see the color of the rounds at the top. Those are brass primered rounds. The rounds in the bottom appear to be lighter and I would suggest to you based on the totality of the evidence that we're going to go through that you are looking at live rounds. 
I just like, I'm sorry, but it, these, these images that were, that were like clarified, quote unquote, um, more like fuzzified in my opinion. Like I just, I, none of the, I can't take it seriously. I, I can't take this photo seriously because also to say that like, those are definitely live rounds. What if they have a hole in the side and they're just turned sideways? Or what if you, what if they're rattlers? You know, I just, anyway, yeah, th this part is where she kind of loses me a bit. And keep in mind, anything that you see on the set of this movie that is a revolver ammunition, that is revolver ammunition prior to October 12th, if it has a silver primer, it's a live round. Because the silver primered dummies didn't come on set for two days after this photograph was taken. Here's our comparison photo that Mr. Primo put together for us. And if you need it, when you're reviewing the evidence and doing your deliberations or engaging in your deliberations, I have included it for you. Um, but we're gonna do a comparison here in a moment. Now, the importance of this photograph, still October 10th of 2021, there, are, there appears to be revolver ammunition in the background there at the top. Two of those have silver primers. The problem with that is the silver primer dummies weren't there yet, but the live rounds were. And there's your close up. It's absolutely undeniable. Is it blurry? Yes. Can you clearly see the difference? Absolutely. <laughs> All of these photos that you're looking at were October 10th. Now, let's move to October 13th of 2021. I invite you to look at that photograph carefully and ask yourselves, which of these is not like the others? It's the third one from the left. Yeah, it's a little chunky. Look at the shape of that projectile and look at the color of the brass. So on October 13th, Mr. Kenny's dummies have arrived on set. They are the only dummy rounds with silver primers, but they are patinaed in color. So when you look at this round, it appears to be a spot on match for the live rounds, but unfortunately we can't see the primer in this photo. So we can't tell if this is a brass primered dummy. That's the reason that we watched thousands of videos and looked at thousands of pictures because then we moved to the production outfitter videos from October 13th, the same day. And we're looking at that same gun holster that was provided to Mr. Baldwin. And there you see it. The third one down has a silver primer. And now you know it is a live round. You know that because it's not a Seth Kinney dummy. If it were, it wouldn't have that shiny brass color. Yeah, see, so you you can't you can't tell me that that there that there's no possibility that he had both kinds of 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 ammo. Um, John O'Rourke, so Hannah is probably for sure going to prison for 18 months and possibly 36 months if found guilty of involuntary manslaughter. Is that fair to assume? Not necessarily. Sentencing is a, is an entirely different different stage here, and they're going to consider all kinds of things like how how many offenses she's had in the past. Um, like a, a, quite a few things will be considered. Um, and it's a max of 18 months. Like I said, there's no minimum. I also don't know if she's convicted both of involuntary manslaughter and of evidence tampering, if those two, um, sentences would be concurrent or, um, like at the same time, or if they would be consecutive one after another. Um, Kyle Mulkey, thanks for the super chat. Her attitude has turned me off on what she says. I, I understand that. And there might be, there might be people in the jury who feel the same way. I would say right now, her tone for me is fine. Her tone in the past has been absolutely terrible at times. Um, but right now I'm actually okay with it. 
So there's your live round. We've seen it on October 10th. We've seen it on October 13th. And there's absolutely no way that the lighting is playing tricks on our eyes when we're looking at these enhanced photos because you see it frame after frame after frame. And now let's move to October 15th. Karen Kuhn arrives on set. I think she was probably there long before the 15th. She is taking photos. She took approximately, as she testified, 9,000 photos. So on the 15th, there it is. There's your silver primer. It's just been moved to a different location in the holster because they're pulling dummy rounds from here, there, and everywhere and putting them in belts and putting them in guns and do, you know doing whatever they want to do. But there it is. It's right there on October 15th. And if you think I'm stretching it, Let's have a look at what we've got here. This is the gun belt that was assigned to actor Jensen Ackles. Because his gun belt was not a shoulder holster, we weren't able to find any photos or videos of it in the thousands and thousands and thousands that we reviewed because they're always covered by his coat. There is the evidence photo of the Baldwin holster on October 21st when it is taken into evidence. You have a Seth Kinney dummy at the top. You have what the FBI determined to be a live round in the second spot. And then you've got three brass primered dummies. October 17th, October 21st. So the video that Mamie Mitchell laid the foundation for. She said, she said that according to her notes, the filming was done on the 17th. Mr. Primo said that he believed according to the camera, it was the 18th. Take whatever date, whatever date you want. That's a match. Seth Kinney dummy at the top, live round next. You've got three brass primer dummies on the 21st, four brass primer dummies on the 17th or 18th, but it is shockingly the same. And there is no question that this one right here was a live round. It was sent to the FBI and they confirmed it. This is Ms. Gutierrez talking about um, her bringing these dummy rounds on set. I had a multitude of the ones with holes and the ones that you shake, so yeah. And I checked those all and I put them into two things. And then we start talking about boxes. Obviously when she says things, she's talking about boxes. They usually had JS on them. This is one my dad sent me and mine are usually beat up pretty bad. Like they're very dirty and gross. She's talking about the box and the styrofoam insert. The box and the styrofoam insert she's saying are dirty. Hers, the ones that she brings on set are dirty. They're not new and clean like some of the other ones. Detective Hancock asks her, this is the one that was or handed that you guys had said that you had pulled from. This is that moment in that interview where Ms. Gutierrez has already shown Hancock the photo from her dad and a, an hour or two later, Detective Hancock decides that now is the time to show her the photo of the box of dummies 
she was pulling from that day. And it won't surprise you to learn they're a spot on match. You have the styrofoam insert from that box of dummies here in evidence. And the reason that we gave it to you so that you can actually look at it in real time and not look at a photograph is because it's kind of dirty and gross. It kind of fits exactly the way that she described it. But there are some characteristics of this styrofoam insert that are gonna become more important. Any, any suggestion by the defense that somehow the box of dummy rounds that Ms. Gutierrez said she was pulling from was swapped out with something different uh, is absolute nonsense. First of all, you know that because you can see the live rounds. If you don't think you can see them on the 10th and you don't think you can see them on the 13th and Another you don't think you picture. can see them on the 15th, you know you're looking at one on the 17th and 18th. You know you are. So where's, where does the sabotage theory go then? The 17th and 18th, the camera crew hadn't quit yet. Mr. Norvell wasn't on set poking around on the, uh, on the prop cart. Mr. Halls hadn't had an opportunity to, to spend any time with the gun. They moved directly from that cart right into Lieutenant Benavides's patrol unit. They go from that patrol unit right into evidence at the Santa Fe County Sheriff's Department. And on November 9th of 2021, Hannah Gutierrez shows Detective Hancock, now Corporal Hancock, the box of dummies that she and her dad have. And if you listen to Mr. Kenny's testimony, what you understand is that the ammunition from the previous set, that being the old way, Hannah brought leftover dummies from that movie onto the set of Rust. And those 45 long Colt dummy rounds were provided by Thel Reed. What you are looking at in this photo is this styrofoam insert. This is the styrofoam insert that had the live round in it. This is the styrofoam insert that came out of the box labeled 45 long Colt dummies with the JS in the middle. Now, let's put it together. Our original evidence photo up here from October 10th, you can see this distinct uh, sort of cut in the styrofoam on that insert that is sitting on her leg on the 10th. You can see that the hole in the styrofoam in the second to the right at the top is dirty. I don't you see can this see a little all. bit of grime. What she's pointing, I don't see any of this You can at all. see it right there. And you're gonna take it into evidence and you can look at it closer. You're gonna see that there's some damage to the styrofoam separators between these two holes. And what do you know? It's right there. Really quick, and Wings, thanks for the super chat. I had sa I've said guilty this whole trial based on negligence, but how you just described recklessness, I would change to not guilty. Okay, well, there you go. I I'll, I'll explain it again after closing arguments and then we'll do a poll um, and then we'll see, we'll see what that looks like. There's a little bit of damage to the styrofoam separators down here. You can see it in the photo on the right. You can look for yourself. It is right here. And what do you know? That silver primered round from October 10th is sitting in the exact same position that it was found on October 21st when the Sheriff's Department 
collected this box, took it into evidence, and photographed it. Ladies and gentlemen, we call that circumstantial evidence, but that's a mountain of circumstantial evidence. It's a mountain of elephants. Prop assistant duties versus armor duties on October 21st of 2021. Let's focus on that day. And listen, I'm not here to tell you that Rust Productions did the right thing when they hired on a part-time armorer and asked her to also spend her time doing props. I think everybody who has testified has said that was a really bad idea. And that's probably part of the reason that they're being sued by a whole bunch of different people. But on October 21st, this was simply not the case. It was not the case on that day. She had three hours in the morning waiting for the camera crew to arrive. She had every opportunity to go through that box of dummies. Gee, that only had like, 30 rounds in it, how long does it take to pull the round out of the box, shake it, and if it doesn't shake, look to see if it has a hole in it, put it back in the box and do that to each and every one of them. How long does that exercise take? 10 minutes max? That's not hard. The other thing that is very important is Ms. Gutierrez didn't get pulled out of the church because she had to go focus on prop duties. She left the gun in the church contrary to all the industry standards uh, for armors on movie sets, for firearm safety on movie sets. And she went back out to her cart so that she could start doing other armor duties. She's getting her fanny pack filled up well, we've seen that. She's filling it with blanks. And we know they're about to do a turnaround. They're going to do this, this, uh, quick, this quick insert with Baldwin. And then they're going to do the shoot scene, the, the, the gunfire scene where they're using blanks. And the law enforcement have come into the church and there's a shootout. So she goes to get ready for it. She just leaves the gun in there. As you heard from many witnesses, she would leave guns unattended all the time. There was nothing unusual about October 21st that caused her to be unable to stay in the church to properly perform her duties. She leaves the gun. She goes back out because for some reason, with the three hours of, uh, of free time that she had in the morning, she didn't get her fanny pack filled up. She didn't get herself ready for that turnaround. So she leaves the gun. Everybody's heard. Armors don't leave the gun. Really quick, Iron Potato Brain, thanks so much for the super chat. I can see the box are the now, same. That's fair. Let's move over to our tampering with evidence charge. How is getting rid of a bag of cocaine tampering with evidence related to involuntary manslaughter? Well, on October 21st, 2021, the shooting occurs, the incident occurs. Um, Ms. Gutierrez understands that someone has been seriously injured. She does not yet know that that person is not going to live or has already died. She gets interviewed at the Santa Fe County Sheriff's Office. I will say, surprisingly, two occasions after this incident where a helicopter had to come in, ambulances had to come in. Um, Ms. Gutierrez on two occasions after that incident spoke about her concerns about her career. Wow. That gives you an idea that you are dealing with someone who is not particularly concerned about the health and safety of others. I don't know that you can say that. And her job was to be concerned about the health and safety of others. But on that day, she's just thinking about herself. I don't know that you can, that you can, she's put that. a lady in the hospital, a man in the hospital. She asks to be escorted to the bathroom 
Corporal Hancock agrees to do that, and we have her on video on the way there expressing dismay about how this will affect her career. I feel like most people Ouch. would be dismayed about their career after that. After the interview, Hannah know. goes back to her hotel. Rebecca Smith goes to Hannah's room. She's been summoned by some other folks to try to sort of sit and visit and give Hannah some support. So Rebecca Smith goes to her room and Rebecca Smith is the person that tells Hannah that Helena Hutchins has now died. And you have to understand in the mind of Hannah Gutierrez, this investigation went from this big to this big because the difference between shooting someone and them living and shooting someone and them dying is a really, really big difference. So she is told by Rebecca Smith, investigation just got giant and very, very serious. So after receiving that information, she offloads this bag of cocaine to Rebecca Smith. Rebecca Smith is a lady that's lived a life. She's used cocaine before, many years previous, but she's used cocaine. She knows what it looks like. She knows how it's packaged. And because she's a former addict, she tosses it in a trash can. When Mr. Bowles gets up here and says, I can't prove to you that it's cocaine, remember, that when people destroy evidence to avoid prosecution, you don't have the evidence that they destroyed, they got rid of it. So I don't have to prove to you by some scientific uh, 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 drug test, I don't have to send that to the lab and get it tested. It's gone, that's the point to the charge. Now, let me, let me digress a little bit and, and run through a couple of things with you. What's all this testimony about this inertia puller? And how's that play into everything? Well, as you heard from Mr. Haig, an inertia puller is a device designed for one task. It disassembles live rounds. That's what it does. Somehow I think the defense got confused about what our potential theory was, that we had a theory that Ms. Gutierrez was turning dummy rounds into live rounds. That was never our theory because that would require quite a bit of equipment. There's no question. But to do the reverse is a whole lot easier. So if you're out of dummy rounds or you're running low on dummy rounds and you've got some live rounds around, you could probably turn a dummy round, I'm sorry, you could turn a live round into a dummy round in five minutes. Why does an armor on a movie set bill for an inertia puller? Well, obviously she had one. Now, let's talk about the OSHA investigation. OSHA doesn't find any wrongdoing with individual employees, only employers. That's their job. They're just an agency that maintains workplace safety. Mr. Genoway confirmed when he was on the witness stand, it's true, his memory was a little bad and Mr. Lewis had to refresh it for him, but he confirmed that Hannah's conduct on the set contributed to their findings that this was not a safe workplace. Please keep in mind that the OSHA investigation is not a criminal investigation. Critically and surprisingly, OSHA never interviewed Gabrielle Pickle. This is critically important because if, if they had interviewed her, they would have known the following things. Anna was granted 10 armor days out of the 12 filming days, not eight. That was right there in the cell phone records. The training days when Ms. Gutierrez is, is sending those messages saying, 
I want more training time, training days. She's not saying these actors, these adults need more training time. She specifically requested additional training time to train the child. And it was refused because first of all, it's a major liability issue. And second of all, the child was never going to fire a gun. So when she asked well, for sure the additional training days, they were denied. That's not the reason Helena Hutchins is dead. Keep in mind, Gabrielle Pickle uh, had a meeting with Hannah and offered her additional assistance so that she would be able to perform her duties effectively. She offered assistance uh, from some of the other folks there on set to try to give her some relief. And keep in mind that on a movie set, the armorer has autonomy with regard to gun safety. The, the, the OSHA finding that Rust Productions failed to properly supervise her is surprisingly incorrect because the armorer has no supervisor when it comes to weapons and gun safety on the movie set. Mr. Halls is just there to be a second pair of eyes. That's it. Now, I think there can be no question that Rust Productions was more than negligent when they hired Ms. Gutierrez because she was not anywhere close to being qualified for this job. In fact, if you recall, Gabrielle Pickle, to her credit, tried to get Ms. Gutierrez to implement a check-in and check-out system because two people had complained that there was a shotgun left unattended. People on the set were complaining about her. They went to production and said, hey, she's not supposed to do that. You can't just leave real guns laying around. So Gabrielle Pickle goes to Hannah Gutierrez, asks for a check-in, check-out system. Hannah Gutierrez says no. Hannah Gutierrez says it's too difficult, it's too much trouble. Gabrielle Pickle didn't prevent her from being safe. In that instance, she did the opposite. She tried to improve firearm safety on the set, but keep in mind, the armor has autonomy. So Gabrielle Pickle is not Hannah Gutierrez's boss when it comes to firearm safety. Ms. Gutierrez gets to do what she wants. Now I can only imagine that after this chain of cases, all of that will change. So the defense has taken a shotgun approach to oh, this case. What a, Seth Kinney what is to blame. Place. Well, no evidence of that. Sarah Zachary is to blame. No evidence of that. Dave Halls is to blame. He shouldn't have taken the gun from her. Um, and he didn't do a good safety check. Well, she is the autonomous decision maker with regard to gun safety. It's not that Dave Halls shouldn't have taken the gun from her. It's that she shouldn't have given him the gun and then turned around and walked away. Uh, the defense, Alec Baldwin is to blame for acting like a prima donna on the movie set and bossing people around. This is Hollywood for heaven's sakes. I would imagine that's relatively common. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that his conduct was right. I am the person who indicted him. Alec Baldwin's conduct and his lack of gun safety inside that church on that day is something that he's gonna to have to answer for. Not with you and not today. That'll be with another jury on another day. Interesting. 
I wasn't sure if they were going to be allowed to talk about Brian Norvell being charged. The gentleman who goes and gets the prop cart and wheels it over and then puts his hand over the crime scene tape and picks up that dummy round and shakes it. You heard Mr. Bowles ask some questions that 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 are intended to make people think that uh, Mr. Norvell either took something off the prop cart or planted something on the prop cart. Well, keep in mind, <coughs> he doesn't have to plant live rounds because we've seen from the photographic evidence, those are there, they're floating around already. Um, so live rounds were on set. They were not planted by, by Brian Norvell. But this man is not a mystery to the state or the defense. I made him come in and sit down for a one and a half hour interview so that the defense could ask him any questions they wanted and they asked him none. Oh man. Not defend. a single question. So what that means is that this is just all smoke and mirrors and deflection. They don't want the truth. We know the truth. You have seen it throughout this trial. And I will remind you that during one of the heated objection exchanges between myself and Mr. Bowles, you heard Mr. Bowles cry out that he was looking for the truth. Listen, I can bring a horse to water, but I cannot make him drink. If you want the truth, I'll bring the guy in. I'll make him available for you to talk to. Ask him some questions. This is this is not a single one. This is weird. This is weird. Where where she's where she's getting into like bowls like like uh, I don't like it. I don't like it at all. Focus on the evidence in the case. Don't focus on on like the attorney on the other side. And mm, I don't like it. I don't like it at all. It must have been that disgruntled camera crew. You mean the people who believed that safety on set was being compromised to such a degree that they left? That decision may very well have saved their lives. So the $60,000 question in this case who brought the live rounds on set? You know the answer to that. I know the answer to that. I'm not telling you that Hannah Gutierrez intended to bring live rounds on set. I'm telling you that she was negligent. She was careless. She was thoughtless. She brought them on set. And you know from the testimony you heard, Sarah Zachary never saw her shake a dummy round. Dave Halls never saw her shake a dummy round. She didn't shake those dummy rounds. For all we know, those dummy rounds were floating around the set of the old way. And Nicolas Cage is lucky to have walked away with his life. Uh, I would be objecting to that. So why does it matter that she brought live rounds on set? It goes to foreseeability. She had six, six live rounds on that movie set. The earliest date that I can track them for you is October 10th. We know that they were there from the 10th to the 21st, six, and she failed to ferret them out for 12 days. What that means is that she wasn't shaking any dummy rounds she wasn't testing anything. None of that stuff that her lawyers want you to think was so difficult. It was no, none of it was happening. It didn't happen the entire time. She didn't find any of them. And folks, if she's not checking the dummy ammunition during the pendency of the filming to make sure that those rounds that are designed to look like live rounds are in fact dummy rounds, this was a game of Russian roulette every time an actor had a gun with dummies. Sadly for Ms. Hutchins, 
her camera crew walked off set that morning and that required her to go into the church and operate the camera herself. And that's what she was doing when the live round that Ms. Gutierrez put in Mr. Baldwin's gun was expelled from that firearm and went all the way through her body. No one told Ms. Gutierrez to leave the church. No one called her out of the church. There wasn't a COVID protocol in place that prevented her from being in the church at that moment. You know from the production outfitter videos, she didn't care about her job. She let it all go. Mr. Bowles is going to argue to you that if, if Mr. Halls had just called Ms. Gutierrez back into the church, she would have done an additional safety check and that live round would have been found. Well, for heaven's sakes, we all know that if she had been called back into the church for an additional safety check, nothing would have changed. I don't know that you can say Her that. safety checks didn't consist of pulling the dummy rounds out of the cylinder, shaking them in front of the actor and the assistant director, showing them that they're dummy rounds and putting them back in. No one ever saw her do that one single time, even though that's industry standard. And the reason it's industry standard is because you can't tell a dummy round by simply spinning a cylinder and looking at the primers unless they are dummy rounds without primers. And that's kind of an interesting fact. We know that six dummy rounds without primers were not loaded into that weapon because one of them turned out to be live and very clearly had a primer. Interestingly though, she had five dummy rounds without primers in her pocket, in her pocket. All she had to do was put those in the gun make sure that the sixth one either rattles or has a hole in it and she's good to go. Because now when you look, when the cylinder gets spun, you can see five of them without taking them out, that they don't have primers. They were in her pocket and she didn't use them. Um, I am going to have another opportunity to speak with you. And when I speak with you uh, last, it won't be as long, I promise. Um, and we will talk about some of our jury instructions then. But I do want to address some of the testimony from, the, from Dr. Gerald from OMI. Uh, because Mr. Bowles is likely to make an argument that there was some sort of medical negligence uh, that contributed to Ms. To, to Ms. Hutchins' death. And I want to talk to you a little bit about Dr. Gerald's testimony. Here are the lethal injuries, the lethal injuries, blood loss from, from the wound. That was the primary lethal in injury. Her blood was leaking into her, in, into her abdominal cavity and a lot of it. And you saw those photographs, you saw the photographs of her clothing. There was a lot of blood. So the first lethal injury that comes from the gunshot it is blood loss associated with it. And the second one, if you recall from Dr. Gerald, uh, the, the wound to the, to the lung was also a lethal wound. Keep in mind, that bullet went into her body, it went through her rib, it severed her spinal cord, it punctured her lung, it came out the back of her shoulder, and a few hours later, Ms. Gutierrez is telling Corporal Hancock that she's worried about her career. If you think that person would have done 
a satisfactory safety check if she had been called back to the church? I am here to tell you that I strongly disagree. The astonishing lack of diligence with regard to gun safety is without question a significant cause of the death of Helena Hutchins. Did Mr. Baldwin also contribute when he pointed the gun at people and pulled the hammer back and regardless of what he said to George Stephanopoulos, pulled the trigger? Yes, he is. And again, we'll deal with that another time. Uh, that reference to George Stephanopoulos is very interesting. That, that indicates to me that they're probably going to use that interview in his trial. Um, but also, it feels strange for her to reference it here because that is not evidence that came in at trial here. And the jury should not have, have seen that to be on the jury. So they may be like, what is she talking about? George Stephanopoulos, what? You don't escape accountability when you load a live round into a prop gun, tell the crew that it has dummy rounds in it, hand it off to an actor and leave the room because he manipulated it. That's the whole point. That was the whole point to him having it. Of course, he was going to manipulate it. It's foreseeable. Everything is so completely foreseeable. Imagine I hand you a gun and I tell you that it's basically empty and I walk away when in fact, I put live ammunition in it. You think an accident might happen? You think that accident is foreseeable? And listen, let's remember some of the testimony from Mr. Carpenter. Control is how we enforce gun safety. We do it with control. When she loses control, which she did repeatedly, Anything goes. Anything goes there. I am going to complete the majority of the portion of my closing arguments with regard to the facts. The next portion will be with regard to the law. When I come back after Mr. Bowles has had an opportunity to address you, uh, we will be asking for justice today for Helena Hutchins. Thank you. Ooh. Are we gonna have, he's going to ask well, if we can have lunch. It's about a bathroom break. We're going to take a bathroom break. Okay. okay. So please don't talk among yourselves or anyone else about the evidence received here in court. Thank you. I'll okay, be back so at um, 10 of. Okay. Ten of meaning ten minutes till. That must be at this point, right? Let's see here. Okay. Um, let's get some let's get some questions here. So, so yeah, I guess we're gonna we're gonna go through this before lunch. Um, yeah, that was an interesting closing argument. I I feel like she started off a lot stronger. Oh, 10 after. So in other words, no, I think another 10 minutes from now. Um, there were some points, though, that seemed objectionable to me. Uh, let's get some questions here. And uh, really quick, one second. Let me get, let me take care of something really, really quick here. Uh, da, 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 da. Hang on. Sorry. Talk amongst yourselves. <laughs> um, Kurt, Uncivil Law, if you're still in the chat, check your DMs. Um, all right, let's get some questions here. 
All right. Perry G wants to know, what do you think the chances are of HDR being guilty and getting a drastically reduced sentence? I think chances are pretty decent. I don't know what her record looks like. Um, but, um, there's, there's quite a few factors that go into it. Um, but I think there's, there's definitely a chance that she gets a, a, a very reduced sentence. Uh, divine inhale with Donna Clifford question. If she's guilty, could she just get a charge and probation or does it have to be jail time? It does not have to be jail time. As far as I understand, I looked to see if there was a minimum, uh, sentencing for it and I, I don't see any. So, um, she could potentially just get probation for it. Dr. Who, A675309, who is pulling demo rounds, Hannah or prop master? According to the evidence that has come out at trial, that would be Hannah. The prop master is in charge of the guns. Hannah is in charge of the ammo, which is so strange to me because it seems like the guns should also be under the, the armorer's domain because, you know, what if you've got, you've got the guns on set and you think it's empty, but it's not. Um, so anyhow, yeah. Uh, Jack Archer, thanks for the super chat. What would the impact be of defense showing it's likely the live ammunition? Ah, it's likely the live ammunition came from SK, i.e. drawing attention to the photo of SK live ammo with nickel primers. What would be the impact of defense showing? I mean, that helps their case to say that this is some kind of sabotage. Um, but to me, it still doesn't eliminate her need to, to check, to check the rounds, to check the chamber for rounds. Um, so for me, it, it doesn't really do much, but for other people, I know this, that they, they find that to be a very important point. All right. Now we are on to defense and there's still, there's still more questions that I have saved here. We'll, we'll get to them. Why do we not hear this? Oh no. Oh. Your time and attention. Sorry, guys. I don't know how I. Sorry. Okay. Sorry. I don't know how I muted that. All right, you may be seated. Mr. Bowles. Thank you, Your Honor. Yeah, please, court, counsel, ladies and gentlemen of the jury. I, I want to start also as I did when this began, which I want to sincerely thank you for your time and attention uh, and all of your work on this case. It's been hard. It's been a, a long case. And I, I want to thank you first. On behalf of Miss Gutierrez Reed, who this is extremely important for her, this this case, and this is her day in court. And it's extremely important that the government rule out every reasonable doubt that there is in this case, because that is our standard in this country. Reasonable doubt is a concept, meaning if you have any reasonable doubt, if you have a reasonable doubt, we cannot convict people in this country. That's how it's set up. Because of that, the burden is on the prosecution, always stays in the prosecution, and so they have to rule out all of the reasonable doubts. In this case, and I'm going to talk about a lot of the evidence soon, but I just want to start with a summary. The prosecutor just presented to you a series of pictures, uh, and those were the pictures they paid the guy $10,000 to enlarge, uh, and they went through the pictures, and they tried to show that there were silver primers, and this is going to be definitive evidence that these live rounds had to be on set at a particular time. Let me tell you why there's reasonable doubt, number one, that they will never be able to rule out in this case. Sarah Zachary threw away rounds. She unquestionably threw away rounds after the shooting. It's undisputed. We have no idea what those look like. We will never have an idea what they look like, and that will never be able to be overcome. That one fact alone prevents that entire picture set up that was just shown to you from being accurate, from being real. Hey, Kurt. Because we have no idea what those other rounds, whether they had silver primers, whether they were dummies, whether they were other types of, of dummies, what they look like. We have no idea. Fact two on the pictures. Seth Kenny told you he had gotten live rounds from Del Reed that went to the 1883 set. Those live rounds were three types. There were three types of bullets. He then brought back around 125 of those of the three types. 
Now, the ones that the state seized, the prosecutors made a point of saying, these don't match the live rounds. However, we don't know what he had because they waited a month to go get him. It was over a month when they searched. And when Mr. Kenny brought in the rounds, he had been talking to the investigator about what was going on in the investigation. So we're never going to have an idea as to what Seth Kenny had and what he provided. Because he also told you in this trial, he had no inventory system. He had no idea what was coming in and going out of his place. The place was a wreck. That's Maybe like true. a train had hit it. There's no way for somebody to, to really understand what they're putting in, what they're going out. And so he also said there were things that went onto the rest set that he hadn't inventoried, hadn't invoiced. He said that there were things that put on there that he didn't have invoiced. So here's the problem with that. We do not know that Seth Kenny only had those patinaed rounds. That's reasonable doubt. That's coming right from the government's witnesses, from Mr. Kenny. That part is unreconcilable. There is a reasonable doubt that will never leave this case on those two points, on the pictures and the live rounds. Now, Ms. Morrissey calls it dishonest for us to raise a question about Mr. Kenny. And I submit it's not dishonest at all because they have the burden to investigate every possibility, uh, every aspect. As anybody in Ms. Gutierrez Reed's place would deserve and would want because their life is on the line as well on felony charges, and it's the government's duty to rule out all these other things. Far from dishonest, what it is, is thoroughness, competence, finding what happened with Seth Kenny, taking his fingerprints, taking his DNA, going through and searching earlier, doing that investigation, and finding out if indeed there is another possibility that they ruled out right away and they never wanted to look into because they rushed to judgment on Ms. Gutierrez Reed from the very beginning. They singled her out on that set. They put her in a cop car, whether she asked or whether they put her in. Uh, she's in a cop car and she never leaves custody until after her statement. They singled her out and they rushed to judgment on her. And that's what you've seen ever since. Ms. Morrissey says, and a camera crew, and she mocks things that we raise as possibilities on the idea that none of it can be possible except Ms. Gutierrez Reed is guilty. That is the only thing that can be possible because I say it. It's not how it works. Bringing up the fact that she's been mocking things is is a potentially a good strategy for for people on the jury who are disliking her tone. People who are in favor of it might be like, whatever. But people who are already disliking what she's like, the way that she's been coming across are probably going to be like, yeah, she's been mocking her her right to to defend herself in this case. Um, so that's an interesting strategy. Miss Morrissey said she indicted Mr. Baldwin. I indicted Mr. Baldwin. Actually, I think it's the state of New Mexico. That's not an individual person with that power. Okay, but let's not get too far into She also like personal sat there when Miss Zachary lawyer from lawyer things. was on the stand. And Miss Zachary, I'll remind you, got an immunity agreement. Miss Zachary was promised she would never be prosecuted. And Miss Morrissey stands up and says, There's no evidence against Miss Zachary. Well, then why was she given an immunity agreement? Why would she need immunity if there's nothing against Miss Zachary? She's given a mutiny agreement, and then he's told on redirect examination by Miss Morrissey, remember, if you don't tell the truth, I can prosecute you. I will prosecute you. So Miss Zachary doesn't tell the version of the truth that the government believes is true. We saw the threat in live court. That did look like that. I'm not going to lie. Her tone, her tone. You can't trust did make some it of the witness testimony in this case. And that will raise a reasonable doubt as well, I submit, because of things like that. Because the lead investigator admits that she practiced her answers and questions with the prosecutor. 
That's something you can consider. Are you hearing everything? Or are you hearing a one-sided version that fits the narrative that Miss Gutierrez Reed has to be guilty because we picked her out first and it's got to be her. Can't be Mr. Kenny. Can't be the, anything else, any other possibility. Sarah Zachary has nothing to do with it. Even though we know unquestionably she threw away rounds after a uh, shooting that's undoubtedly going to be evidence, but, but there's nothing on her, apparently. Second, these boxes, the idea that the boxes match. We heard testimony that these rounds were loaded in and out of these boxes daily. Nobody knows what was in them on the 13th, the 16th, the 21st, because the rounds were put in, they were taken out, and they were put in different boxes. So the boxes really are, don't matter. There's, there's reasonable doubt all over the place to the boxes because we don't know what was in them three or four days before. It doesn't matter who brought them. Um, the boxes are interesting because the government wants to match up the two and they want to show the pictures that match, yet all the ones from PDQ Props have the same label, same font. They're from Joe Swanson. So those boxes are, are similar to the ones on set. So that, that part is is not conclusive as well. The other part, when the government shows you video and video of video on, only on the 13th and says Miss Gutierrez-Reed was lax on safety. Well, again, you're seeing videos from short snippets of time on one day on an entire movie set, and then you're not seeing what Miss Gutierrez-Reed may have done right after the clip. You're not seeing what might have happened right after that. The other thing that strongly rebuts all of the safety points Ms. Morrissey is pointing out of, about Ms. Gutierrez-Reed is OSHA. Now, they try to downplay OSHA, but OSHA is a separate, independent state and federal agency that did a full investigation into the responsibility for safety failures on this set. And you can evaluate the credibility in your minds of, of Mr. Montoya, who took the stand and how you thought he testified, whether you thought he was thorough and how he answered questions. He, he interviewed quite a few people and he reviewed a lot of information. Their conclusion after that was done was that production was responsible. He said the root cause was production adopted a safety plan and it ended at the word adoption because they didn't do anything after that. They didn't respond to complaints that there were safety concerns. They didn't allow for more training and take the time to do that. They did not respond to the negligent discharges and deal with that. Mr. Halls talked to one of the guys briefly and that was all that happened. So you got to set that they're not allowing a time for inventory for the armor. They're not allowing time for them to clean their weapons or deal with their weapons. This is management. You just heard Mr. Pesh state that the first assistant director is the primary person for safety on that set. Dave Halls have been doing this 30 years. Somebody doing it 30 years has a responsibility and duty to step in when there's safety things going on. And he's on several of those videos. He has a responsibility to step in and say, hey, we're going to stop this. We're going to slow this down. We're going to have meetings. We're going to have additional safety training. and We're going to address this. Ms. Gutierrez, Reed, come over here. We're going to do this and we're going to talk to people. She also can come in and talk about that. And on those videos, they're both on the videos. But OSHA found because of the lack of support, because she's a part-time armor, because she's not full-time, because she's not, there's not two of her. As Mr. Carpenter said, two is one and one is none. Well, here we didn't even have one. We had a half. So she's trying to run around and do various things. She's a half a, a, a job on a set with over 20 guns, and they want to lay the complete blame on her in this case, as opposed to OSHA, who investigated as an official agency and made an official determination that this was production and management that was responsible. That's important. That's an important finding because they said – all of this was caused safety-wise by management. As Mr. Sousa told you, the buck stops with production. The buck stops with production. As in any organization, it starts at the top. 
you don't go and take one of the lowest people on the call sheet after something bad and happens, after the whole management team is just thrown safety aside in favor of money, in favor of speed, in favor of profit. You throw all of that aside because at the end, you've got a convenient fall person. You've got a convenient scapegoat. And she may not be the armor on some days. She's a props person, but she's certainly the armor when everything goes bad. You know why? Because despite OSHA's uh, findings that they were responsible production, the guys that you saw come in, the producers, the big guys, they want to sail off into the sunset and go on about their business, finish the movie, make the money, because they've got the convenient fall person sitting right here. And all that has to happen is everybody has to gang up. Everybody has to have their talks after this happened and blame Hannah. So it has to happen. That's what happened in this case. You had a production company on a shoestring budget, an A-list actor that was really running the show. He was directing people in those clips, telling the camera person where to go, telling the armor where to go. And then you had a situation where at the end they had somebody they could all blame. It didn't work out with OSHA because OSHA didn't buy it. OSHA said it was the higher ups. So here we are in a criminal court where the government tries to pin all of it on Ms. Gutierrez Reed. And it's just not the truth. It's absolutely right. We do want the truth. We want the truth and all the facts that were found by OSHA to be considered. We wanted all of the facts that you don't have in this courtroom to be considered because that's the only fair way to do it, to resolve all reasonable doubt and to rule it out. If you don't have that all seems evidence, objectionable. you can't rule out all of that reasonable doubt. Well, was there an objection? No, I'm just saying it seems I'm objectionable. I about foreseeability. Oh, sorry. And I want to play this for you. Kurt, sorry. I, 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 I forgot you were... I, you've been so quiet. I forgot that your your mic you were you were here with your mic on, and I thought I was like, oh, is that from the courtroom? <laughs> um, what are you what are you thinking on that? Well, yeah, the the referring to evidence that's not in the courtroom. I mean, obviously, the the trial is based on the evidence that's in the courtroom. So, referring to evidence outside the courtroom just seems like an improper argument. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, Carrie Morrissey also referred to stuff that's not in evidence in her closing, which also seemed ob objectionable. But no one objected, so I don't know. Yeah, this is. I, I don't. I don't mind them saying, like they can say, well, they interviewed this person, but didn't interview this person. But now they're just referring to evidence in an amorphous way. That there's mm -hmm. evidence out there that does that's not considered. I'm like that. That doesn't work for me. Yeah. 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 Well, now he learned how to play video. He really likes to harp on this this one. Motherfucker. <laughs> you probably remember that. Um, that was the scene where Mr. Baldwin runs up the hill and <laughs> Cut is yelled. And right after Cut is yelled, he shoots. That's... I submit reasonable doubt, and I'll, I'll tell you why. Because Mr. Baldwin went off script. He chose to fire after cut was called. And you're going to see where he does later do the same thing in this tragic shooting. Mamie Mitchell told you on the stand, the script supervisor, what? that it was not in the script for Mr. Baldwin to point the weapon. It was not in the script for him to point the weapon. And we have to be very careful with facts when we're considering a, cri a criminal case He's trying to get and to the an beyond the reasonable involved. doubt standard. That's extremely important because Ms. Gutierrez Reed, nor anybody else, knew that Mr. Baldwin in that moment 
was going to point the weapon right at Helena and Ms. Hutchins and Mr. Souza and do what he did. That is the concept of foreseeability. Now, Ms. Morrissey gave you an example of if I hand somebody a, a firearm and it's loaded and then they go and do something with it uh, and it hurts somebody. But here, what we had, we she did not know Mr. Baldwin was going to do what he did. No one, first of all, called her back into the church that he was using the gun at that time. She had given it to Halls to sit in in the church. Mr. Halls then gave it to Mr. Baldwin, and that is the conclusion of the lead investigator. That was what Baldwin said, and that is what Ms. Gutierrez-Reed said. Also wasn't supposed to have So round. Halls hands it to him. No one calls her back in to let her know Baldwin is doing that blocking scene. She doesn't know that's happening. The medic said she did not hear anybody call that out, first team, over the channel. So that's not getting put out. So Baldwin's doing an, another audible like he did on this video audible. that you just saw. Yeah. He's going off script. That defeats any idea that that was foreseeable to Miss Gutierrez-Reed. If she doesn't know what's happening... She can't foresee it. That's a big uh, part of the, inst the instruction. He's trying to paint. The other part I want to talk about cause. foreseeability and where this matters is live rounds. Now, live rounds in this type of situation has not happened in Hollywood. In the hundred years of Hollywood, this has not happened in a situation like we saw in this case. No one on that set foresaw, knew, or thought that live rounds were going to be on that set. No one. You did not hear one witness in this case. Uh, even Miss Morrissey said there was no evidence that Hannah knew about live rounds coming on or this, this was done. There's no evidence of that. Nobody thought live rounds were going to be on set. Mr. Souza um, told the doctors he couldn't believe it. He argued with them because it was inconceivable that live rounds would appear. Because of that, you, when you read the jury instructions, there's a concept in the involuntary manslaughter of an element of willful disregard of the rights of another. That word willful, and I'm going to go over it soon, means purposeful. That you willfully do, do something, you purposefully do something. <laughs> Look at this guy nodding What's in impossible the back. for the government to prove in this case you're going to really she give her hanger harangue him on that, like the mischaracterization of the law. I'd be like, get bent as a judge. I'd be like, give, give me a break. Yeah. Well, so, I mean, but it's not, well, willfulness and, and, and recklessness are two different things. He said purpose, right? And I think that's reasonable to view it the same. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to talk about willful more in a moment when we get there but it cannot be willful one on that objection if hannah does not know there's live rounds and nobody did so she did not do something willfully knowing that baldwin could foreseeably hurt somebody with this firearm because she didn't know it was live and let me give you an example um, it's akin to uh, a nurse let's say in a hospital who the pharmacy mislabels uh, a drug. And let's say it comes to her and, and somebody's ordered it be administered to a patient. She then administers it not knowing that is a fatal drug of some other type. The pharmacy's mislabeled it. The patient passes. It's the same situation as we have here where the government would be saying the nurse committed involuntary manslaughter. No, that's not true because she did not know what happened. It's like a long time ago um, when the Tylenol capsules were laced with, with cyanide way back in the 80s or somewhere around there. The, there was like no the prosecution of the pharmacies that didn't know about this. They were tainted by it. It's the same type of situation we have here. It was tainted by a guy going around a pharmacy and injecting cyanide into it. 
It's not quite. Yeah, analogous. I was going to say there's there's a there's a there's a there's an important distinction between his hypothetical and this current <laughs> case, which is that she has the ability <laughs> to to check yeah. it, whereas somebody who's who's you yeah. know administering you know medicine, you you don't necessarily know that it's been tainted. You don't necessarily have yeah. a way of 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 seeing that it's that it's been tainted. Whereas in her case, she does, and yeah. there's there's a methodology to it, and she's been trained on it. You know what I mean? Like it's just there's that's an important distinction between the two but you know props to him for 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 the attempt he did not know there were live rounds and she was entitled to rely on production buying dummies and the boxes labeled dummies she's entitled to rely on that and that reliance is reasonable so she cannot foresee a live round now i want to talk next about miss gutierrez reed's statements to law enforcement you saw her first statement. She didn't have a, an attorney. She did waive her rights and answer her question. She had not been advised at that time. Ms. Hutchins had passed. And she came in a second time and answered all questions. The reason why I say that is she was cooperative. She was trying to assist in what this investigation, uh, what they were investigating. Now, Corporal Hancock... Corporal Hancock never fully investigated the source of the live rounds. And she told you that she focused on people on the set. So again, in ruling out reasonable doubt and where those live rounds came from, we have not done that in this case because there was never a full investigation as to the source of the live rounds. Let me give you an example. The state never called Joe Swanson. And it's kind of remarkable because Joe Swanson was the original source of where these came from. He's also the JS and all the boxes. So the idea that the person where it originated, you wouldn't call that person and get some more information is, is interesting. But more than that, it leaves a huge hole in the origin of the live rounds. Let me tell you what else it is. Seth Kinney's fingerprints and DNA were never taken. Yeah, I agree. That's that's Seth that's Kinney talked to Corporal Hancock 40 times or more. They supplied information back and forth. And he starts making you wonder about what's going on and why I'm I'm called dishonest for raising the possibility that maybe Mr. Kinney was the source. Because he's pretty tight with law enforcement in this case, obviously. They don't do a prop search warrant until six days after the incident. And that was Corporal Hancock and the rest of the sheriffs. They don't search Mr. Kenny's business until over a month after. They never asked the FBI to check live rounds for fingerprints or DNA. And so we will not know if Mr. Kenny's fingerprints or anybody else's would have ever appeared on those live rounds on set because they didn't get that evidence. Bryce Ziegler, I want to tell you a little bit, remind you a little bit about his testimony, and that's Mr. Ziegler. Um, he talked about Baldwin's revolver being single, single action. You have to cock it, and then uh, every time you want to shoot it, he testified about breaking that firearm. They actually destroyed the firearm um, after testing that was approved by the sheriff by hitting that with a hammer. He talked about that you can't determine a live round from a picture. And that's the other point I think is important to consider when considering the picture analysis. Now, the Latin print examiner, the Latin print uh, examined Latin print? various things, but she did not examine anything uh, Seth Kenny wise. There's no analysis on the cartridges from the prop cart and found eight FBI employee prints. Mr. Gillette on the, the powder testing only tested 11 rounds from Seth Kenny. Again, we know that he brought back 125 from the group that went to 1883. And I also want to remind you about 1883. Some of those were Starline brass rounds. And some of those he said had silver primers. So when we get to the set, the live rounds are Starline brass and they have silver primers. 
it's a continuous chain that could have been traced from Del Reed all the way to Seth Kenny all the way back to the set. But they did not do that thorough investigation, and that's reasonable doubt they have not ruled out. The dummies, again, I submit this is another area of reasonable doubt. Witnesses testified this set contained a dangerous mix of dummies. They were dangerous because it was impossible for the armor and prop master to hear and rattle all of the dummies, uh, especially under pressure, rushing, and noise on the set. You saw there was a lot of wind that day on the lapel. There's people running around. There's, I think at one point somebody said 200 people. There's all kinds of things going on. Um, and despite that, Mr. Haig uh, indicated in a quiet office he could not hear one of the dummies when it's rattled. That's dangerous because when you're trying to do it quickly, when there's a lot of noise, it may be a dummy. Um, it may not. You can't hear it rattle. Seth Kenny, again, mentioned in this case that he always rattle tested his rounds. And he made sure they're dummies. He told you all that. Well, the problem, the, even the box that they say was Seth Kenny's and the rounds that came out of it, there was one round, if you remember, that was gunked and it didn't shake. That round had to be sent to the FBI to be broken apart and to be checked to see if it was live. So if he truly is that thorough and shaking, he missed that round. Now the producers. I'm actually kind of surprised that that the the state did not bring up on in her closing argument um, the fact that Hannah said in her police interview that she shook the whole box to see if it rattled to check if they were dummies. Uh, that's that's a good way to go about it. Yeah, just shake the whole box. That's that's definitely the same thing as shaking each individual round. Oof. Yeah. I'm I'm wondering if maybe she's gonna if she's gonna bring that up on on in her uh, her rebuttal, but we'll we'll see. There were there were some points there that I, I and actually I, I was just reminded of that from from his closing just now, showing all, all those boxes and talking about the rattling and all that kind of stuff. But I was like, oh yeah, remember when she said she rattled the box? Um, anyway, uh, yeah, there were some other points in her interview that I remember was like, what? What are you talking about? That's insane. Anyway, let's continue. <laughs> they had oversight over the budget team. They didn't know where the funds were set aside for the armor. They were on location for filming. Also, they really chose a terrible picture <laughs> for this witness. Um, I mean, hey, he's a, he's a state witness, so they, they probably don't care. But I mean, they, they really could have picked a better screenshot. And they were fined the statutory maximum by OSHA for managerial safety violations. Again, OSHA found that the management team are the ones responsible. And yet we're here with Ms. Gutierrez-Reed, the person on trial for the felony offenses. Sherilyn Schaefer was the medic on set. You recall she did not have a chest seals. Um, she, I think, was doing the best she could with the equipment that she had, but she didn't have the um, complete equipment to deal with a gunshot wound. She also indicated she never heard anyone call out use of a gun before the fatal shooting. Mamie Mitchell. I think, I think the defense completely misused the, the EMT as a witness because her lawsuit basically had the same claims that Hannah did saying mm -hmm. she did, she wasn't given what she needed in order to properly do her job. They totally could have, could have like brought her like the, the the sympathizing side of of her testimony brought that over to hannah's side to be like same same she's basically saying the same thing even though she's the state's witness although Ooh, I maybe i'm missing earlier maybe i'm missing it but, sorry but he said earlier that this this idea of this mechanism mechanism of shooting has never happened in hollywood ever so you wouldn't you wouldn't presumably have things in your emt kit to deal with that because it's never been seen before. So would there be some other reason that she would have chest seals other than the shooting, which by his own admission, no one expected in the first place? Yeah. I so don't know. Is it, I mean, is, is it, is it, is it negligent in some way not to provide her with the chest seals? Because why would she need them? Yeah. I don't know. I, mm, 
the whole the whole point in having someone like an EMT is because unforeseeable, well, somewhat unforeseeable things happen. And the whole point in having an armor on set is because there's there's a risk of of harm from guns from firearms. So it's like I don't know. I just I, it does seem like the equipment that she needs to have also should include like the the big danger on set. Okay. I don't I don't fault her for that by the way. That's production. Uh, before the fatal shooting. Mamie Mitchell, I touched on this earlier. Most important thing Miss Mitchell said was that it was not in the script for Baldwin to point the firearm. That goes directly to the element when you read the jury instructions and you all go back in to deliberate. Uh, that goes to foreseeability. And whether or not anybody can foresee the moments Mr. Baldwin pointing the gun, using it as a, a pointer, he's up on the hill shooting after cut, and then he's shooting... Uh, pointing the gun when he's not supposed to in scenes. David Halls, um, David Halls was the first assistant director, uh, as you remember, and he was in charge of overall safety. Now he got a misdemeanor, uh, six months unsupervised probation. Even though he was in charge of overall set safety, he never raised any concerns. And in fact, I think he said Hannah did a great job as armor. He indicated he did not hand the gun to Baldwin. But the sheriff contradicted this. So did Hannah and so did Mr. Baldwin. Uh, and that was essentially Mr. Hall's testimony. Sarah Zachary, I remind you, she threw away rounds on set after the shooting. Look at that emoji. Took items off the prop cart. She worked for Seth oh, Kenny that's right. and she texted and called him right after the shooting. That's right. That was that was the emoji that she got from Alec Baldwin by text. I forgot about that. With what respect she, after one of her the text, shooting? She indicated she has said she was talking okay, to Alec Baldwin and trying to choice. keep her facts straight. She mentioned that she had loaded firearms on set. She picked up ammunition from Kenny at PDQ. I'll remind you in the testimony that Sarah Zachary and Hannah Gutierrez-Reed went to Kenny's place before production started. And he had given them I'm just glad if I ever shoot someone firearms. in the future, I know what so emoji again, to use. Got we don't know exactly now. what Mr. Kenny may have supplied to this set because it's not inventory. It's not all invoiced. I also remind you about Sarah Zachary when you're considering her credibility and her testimony. She had the text where she wanted Hannah to go to jail. And she's given complete immunity. Seth Kenny, Another again, I, I mentioned this, he supplied the Leathers Guns and Allen before be rest began. He had no inventory system. And I, we attached some pictures to the right that you can look at in the, the jury room about his place. It was an absolute mess. There was stored lime, live ammo in the bathroom. Mm. And one of the things I think was important to remind you of is he actually called Joe Swanson and had a conversation with him. And after... He gets off the call. His first words are shit, shit, shit. And so that's something as an investigator, you would think after he does that, maybe I should call Joe Swanson and see what's happening. See what that means. That reasonable doubt has not been ruled out. I went over this um, on the 1883 set and he brought 125 uh, rounds back. Mr. Carpenter, I want to remind you, he was a state's expert armor. One of the most important points he said was two is one and one. Kurt, how do you spell armor? It's with a U, isn't it? Well, that, that would o be the... O-U, isn't it? But isn't it A-R-M-O-R-E-R? Or A M O A R M O U R E R. I mean, that's like that's like the Canadian version. The American version would be without a U. Canadian British. Okay. Yeah. So the people are saying E R. I thought it was spelled. Oh, spelled. I I, I thought it was spelled with a U in American English okay. too. But there so should they're be. That, in... They're saying that's a Commonwealth spelling. So okay. yeah, yeah. That's I only, yeah. I only knew it the British way. Who knew? Either way, e either way of those two. I'm just looking at this. This looks misspelled. I'm being ticky tacky a little bit, but details can set an impression. I, this is misspelled. One is none. And here we didn't have 
uh, a properly staffed armor uh, component to the set. Luke Haig, he said the live rounds on set were reloads. Um, he could not hear the dummy rattle in a quiet office, and he said Mr. Bowen violated basic safety rules. He also testified that he loved Karen his Karen Kuhn, guns. you may remember, was the photographer. Well, this she I said the armor ER. was checking guns before when she was present. Yeah. So we just didn't and spell check the other And she also made a comment about Mr. Baldwin. What's that? So we just didn't spell check the other slide. Not that it's okay. important or anything. I mean, you know. It's, I mean, at the end of the day, is that, is that going to make a difference between guilty and not guilty? No. But it's just, you don't yeah. want to make these kind of mistakes. I just, I don't know. I, I was taught early on <laughs> in my in my baby lawyer upbringing that those kind of like those kind of details can make a can end up making a bad impression and that can subconsciously make a further impression about you and your skills as an attorney, et cetera, et cetera. Yep. I'm gonna go back five seconds. In guns before when she was present. And she also made a comment about Mr. Baldwin that on the day she was taking questions, I believe she said on the twenty first, he told her to get out of his personal space and said something in a, a manner that kind of goes along with how he was on the set. Um, Mr. Souza was kind about it. He said he had a strong personality, but you can see it in the videos and you can see how Mr. Baldwin was acting. Rebecca Smith, I want to talk about the tampering. She said that, that she hadn't used cocaine in 31 years. She saw a baggie inside a baggie for approximately five seconds. She didn't know if it was cocaine or meth or something else. And she admitted at the end she was guessing. And we also know that the substance in the baggie was never tested. And right. so the, the only evidence you have of narcotics in this case is a guess. Now, Ms. Morrissey in her closing indicated that, well, of course we don't have the evidence. The whole thing is throwing it away. Well, you have to prove first that it was evidence. So in a normal tampering case, when let's say a firearm's thrown away, and we know a firearm was used and somebody throws a firearm away, we know that was a firearm. So we know that would be evidence in a case involving a shooting. Here, we have an unknown substance. Again, they have to rule out all of the reasonable doubt by that. It's Good not point. enough to say it's probably something under a criminal standard. It's probably cocaine in that bag because Ms. Smith says it is. If it even happened, we don't even know this happened. The government hasn't established that except through her testimony. We don't know if there was some a bad corroboration with some text messages. We don't know if this actually was passed. And that's their burden. It let's say it did happen. That you you believe it did happen. It's not enough to say what was probably in that bag. They have the burden to rule it out beyond a reasonable doubt that it couldn't have been anything else. And she's already calling it in her testimony, potentially multiple substances, cocaine, methamphetamine, or possibly something else. So she's not even certain. Creatine about monohydrate. What it is. Without a, a, a test, without something presumptive to tell you on a test, there's no way of telling what was in that bag. And it's not enough in a criminal case. OSHA, we talked about in detail. And I just want to remind you the root cause they found, they attributed all the responsibility for safety issues to management. Mr. Elliott, uh, he was defense expert investigator, got an extensive law enforcement experience, if you recall, in APD and military. One of his big points was Mr. Baldwin was not segregated at the beginning, even though he was the known shooter. Hannah was segregated right away. Again, they zeroed in on her uh, in the the rush to have her identified. He indicated there was 20 or so key witnesses not identified and segregated. And the problem with that is they can get their stories together and they can uh, change their stories. They can have their memories altered. We know this happened in this case because after the incident, Mr. Baldwin is talking to Sarah Zachary. Uh, she's he's texting and talking to her. Seth Kenny's talking to Sarah Zachary. Mr. Halls is talking to Baldwin after. And so we don't have all the information they're talking about, but we do know they're coordinating, they're talking. The only one not in that group uh, was, was Hannah. And again, this was the idea. 
we've got to circle the wagons and we've got to pick out the person that's going to take the fall for everything that's happened here. That's Hannah. That's who they got. Law enforcement failed to follow up on the origin of the live rounds and their delayed search warrants caused problems with missing evidence. PJ Pesh testified just this morning. Um, he had said, like everybody else, he's never seen in 35 years an armor split duties with props. It's not possible for one person to keep track of so many firearms. And he indicated it's important to give the armor adequate time and resources, which OSHA said as well. She was not given that to do her job. I want to talk to you about the law that the judge instructed you on, and, and that is the law. What the judge uh, told you about is what has, we, we have to follow in terms of evaluating this. The law presumes the defendant to be innocent. The burden is always on the state to prove guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. A reasonable doubt is a doubt based upon reason and common sense. The kind of doubt that would make a reasonable person hesitate to act in the graver and more important affairs of life. A doubt based on reason and common sense. So what the government has to do is rule out every reasonable doubt you may have based on reason and common sense. Or in this country, we don't convict people. That's the standard. And again, I go back to where I started at the beginning. If they didn't rule out the reasonable doubt on Miss Zachary throwing away the rounds, that is always going to be there. Because their theory based on you can identify these pictures and we know exactly what was on the set and what remained on the set and what we will never know that because some of them were thrown away. And we didn't get all of Seth Kenny's rounds. We're never going to know that. Other areas of reasonable doubt, I've gone over the top two, top three. The prop cart was tampered with. Uh, we know that right after the incident, another individual moved it. Now, Lieutenant Benavides said he had eyes on uh, the entire time. But if you saw that video, you can make up your mind what you believe. Um, ladies and gentlemen, his camera appeared to be pointed right into the vehicle. And the individual getting the cart was way off in the other direction. He said he had his head turned, but you all can decide uh, what you think about that. The prop cart, there was unquestionably items taken from it. We don't know exactly what those are. That is another area of reasonable doubt that the government has not ruled out. You've had witnesses say throughout the trial, you can't tell live ammo from a picture. And the reason is that the FBI said it has to be disassembled and you have to open it up because there's powder in it. If there's not powder in it, then it's not live. OSHA stated the root cause of all safety failures was management. OMI ruled this to be an accident, not a homicide. You heard evidence about the esophageal intubation was ineffective to provide oxygen to Helena. This also was a situation in this case where multiple lawsuits have been filed and you can evaluate their testimony, those people who have filed lawsuits with care and caution because they've got an interest potentially in what's happening in this case by being involved in lawsuits. Involuntary manslaughter, uh, you're going to have that instruction when you go back, that is the um, charge that the, the, Her Honor has read to you. She's giving you the law on this. I want to focus you on a couple key points. The government has the burden to show each of these elements beyond a reasonable doubt. Uh, the elements are the numbered items. What that means is if you all have reasonable doubts on any of these elements, Hannah cannot be convicted. And I want to focus you in on element three, that Hannah acted with a willful disregard Again, you go back to willful disregard, the nurse example, and the idea that if somebody doesn't know, I mean, that could be the same thing with a nurse on trial for involuntary manslaughter, but if she doesn't know the drug was mislabeled, 
you cannot hold her criminally accountable for something like that. It's the same thing in this case because no one knew there were live rounds. So she did not act willfully in anything that happened that day. In loading the, the firearm, this was a nor another day everybody thought on set. Loading the firearms, running to different things, doing the duties. Nobody's calling her back in for the blocking scene. Mr. Baldwin's doing something on his own. Nobody in the wildest dreams thought there was a live round. And because of that, the next element is that Hannah Gutierrez Reed that caused the death. I submit to you that what caused uh, her to pass was Mr. Baldwin going off script and pointing the weapon. Now, he didn't know uh, there was yeah. a live round in there either. That's what he's trying to say. He didn't know. Again, he's in the same position that nobody knew there was ever going to be a live round on that set. But the only the only ultimate act is this pointing of that weapon. Miss Gutierrez wasn't in the church. She didn't point that weapon. She didn't pull it. Nobody called her back in. And because of that, those two elements I submit to you have not been proven on involuntary manslaughter. And they have to be. The government has to resolve all your reasonable doubts about that, or they don't, you cannot, uh, we cannot convict. Mental state and willful disregard. Uh, and that is going to be in your in your instructions. For you to find the defendant acted negligently in this case, you must find that the, the defendant acted with willful disregard. And, and so, the, again, that's the terminology, is willful disregard. You're also going to be instructed, the court instructed you, Her Honor, on negligent use of a firearm. And that is a, a lesser included offense of the involuntary manslaughter. Uh, so when you go back and deliberate, you will have uh, this in front of you as well, whether Miss Gutierrez Reed endangered the safety of another by handling or using a firearm in a negligent manner. And again, the language is acted with willful disregard. That's what has to be proven under that charge <clears throat> for her, for you to resolve all of your reasonable doubts. Tampering with evidence, I think this is, a, a real stretch and it's a it is a real stretch and, and you talk about guessing this one they have to prove the defendant hit a bag of cocaine well the only witness they have to it said it was either cocaine or meth or something else so just just by the testimony alone the beginning of that you can't there's no way of knowing it was a bag of cocaine it's just impossible there has to be reasonable doubt on that by the government's own witness. Their only witness. No law enforcement testing. There's nobody else. That this, this is absolutely unproven in this case. And you don't even have to get to element two because element one is not even close to having, having been proved beyond a reasonable doubt. Proximate cause, it's a legal term, but it's something that government has to prove as well. And this is where you get into that the passing was a foreseeable result of Hannah Gutierrez's act. The act was a significant cause of the death and the language I want to focus you in on in a natural and continuous chain of events uninterrupted by an outside event. What these mean, and legal, these are the legal terminology, what it means is that what Hannah Gutierrez did had to be a foreseeable result, but again, that caused her death. But again, without her knowing that there was a live round, that's impossible to meet that standard. She did not have that knowledge, and there's no witness that came in here in this courtroom in two weeks to say she had that knowledge. Without it, nothing she did. She has that willful disregard because she just doesn't know. Now, was there an outside event as well? There was an outside event. There's two outside events. Whoever put the live round on set and then Mr. Baldwin in the end going off script and doing what he did. Those are outside events outside of Miss Gutierrez Reed's control that she didn't know was going to happen. I'm not buying his argument on foreseeability. That breaks any idea uh, and there's reasonable doubt that she had anything to do ultimately with 
Helena Hutchins death. Ms. Gutierrez Reed was not a significant cause as a result of her death because of the reasons I've mentioned to you. Another instruction her, her honor gave you is that negligence of a third person, again, I'm gonna highlight the language, if it breaks the foreseeable chain of events. Um, again, the foreseeable chain of events on that set is you have dummy rounds, you have blank rounds, and then you have um, an orderly progression with how those are being used. Here, we had a completely unforeseeable live round, uh, six live rounds that were on set, nobody could foresee. And then we have Mr. Baldwin's action in the end. Those were both unforeseeable to Ms. Gutierrez-Reed. The judge instructed you on, you all are the sole judge of the facts. You all are deciding the facts, ladies and gentlemen, and your verdict should not be based on speculation, guess, or conjecture. It goes back to the tampering charge. Um, it goes back to some of the other aspects the government has told you. In this country, we can't decide and convict people on guesses. And that's a lot of what they've asked you to do in several areas, to guess, to assume, to speculate. It's not sufficient to convict people in this country to guess. It's not. And that's what they brought you and they've asked you to do on the tampering and other aspects of their charges. And that's not sufficient. Ladies and gentlemen, Hannah is not guilty on all the counts because of the law that her honor has given you. When you apply that law and you apply the standard of beyond a reasonable doubt, she could not anticipate what Baldwin would do. It was not in the script. It was not foreseeable. Management was responsible for safety failures and not Hannah. There's zero evidence of cocaine. There's no testing. And again, I go back to the idea that Hannah is a scapegoat for all the management failures. They do hope she gets convicted. So they're all exonerated. They can move forward. They can finish that movie like Mr. Sousa said they did and make their money. But as he also told you, the buck always stops with production. And it's their responsibility. In any organization, it goes from the top down. And that's where the responsibility lies in this case. That's what OSHA said. And that's also the truth. And the truth is important because justice for Helena does not mean injustice for Hannah. Line. Does not mean injustice for Hannah. It does not mean they get to steamroll her and they get to come in and spin their version of facts and they get to call it truth because that's not truth. Truth is bringing you, ladies and gentlemen, everything they can. Justice is bringing you everything they can. Justice is not mocking theories that could come true. That might have been the case. Justice is not laughing in court during some of our exchanges. And you can evaluate that as to their credibility, whether that was professional, whether if she didn't take court seriously, did she take the investigation seriously? Oh, he's referring to the lead investigator. I submit she did not. And so they can't come in here a Morrissey at first. with a straight face and mock us and criticize us and tell you they have given you enough to convict her behind a reasonable doubt because they haven't. Thank you. I don't I don't like the squabbling in these closing arguments. I the, thought the overall it was a very it was a good closing argument overall. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it, it was all right, but both sides did this at, some, at various points in their closing arguments where they're like talking smack about the other attorney. I could do without it, personally. I agree. I agree. The um, investigator, not so much. I throw them under the bus. That's fine. <laughs> that's a witness. That's a witness, yeah. and and the yeah. witness's conduct while they're on the stand is is subject to criticism. So yeah, I, yeah, I, I would, I I agree with you on that. But it's it's that the attorneys are not are not 
part of the evidence here. They're the ones that are bringing the case to the jury. So this whole like, like, oh, you know, like he didn't say a single word. I can bring a horse to wa to water, but I can't force it to drink kind of thing. And then him, you know, talking, you know, it's just, I just, I don't like it. I don't like it from either side. No, I totally Any agree. Other? There's no, there's no reason. There's no reason to insult opposite counsel. You know, yeah. you are not your client and they are not the other party's client. You know, they're exactly your, your relationship doesn't have to be antagonistic to win your case right so, just do your job that's all do your job man yeah. um let me get some some questions here before we get to the the rebuttal um carolyn says why isn't hdr being charged for mr souza's injury well he didn't die so that's why they're they're not bringing in voluntary manslaughter for him um jerry roth if hannah gets a hung jury and later it's revealed seth has something to do with it by his handling can hannah sue the state of new mexico no there's something called sovereign immunity um, you can only sue the state for things that they expressly allow you to sue them for um, by statute. Um, Nomad Purple, do the jury get to tell the lawyers how badly they did after the verdict? They're free the, to talk to anyone they like. Yes. Yeah. After the, after this case is over, after they've given their, their verdict, um, they are free to, to fully express themselves to the media, to the attorneys, to basically everyone if they so choose. Um, Jerry Roth, uh, why is it tampering with evidence as opposed to destruction of evidence? If she got rid of it, wouldn't he, it be destruction of evidence? Well, destruction of evidence is one form of tampering of evidence. There, there are multiple forms, even just, just hiding it temporarily, altering it, you know, um, making up evidence like that's, that's included in, in, uh, tampering with evidence. Um, Pamela C, can the judge interrupt a closing argument? Yes, she can. Eric Conley, but it's effective. It's bitchy, but does it work? And so this was talking about her, her, her snide comments about him during her closing. I don't know. Maybe, maybe, maybe not. It, it, like I said, closing arguments are, are intended to be directed to your supporters on the jury panel. So like the people that are already kind of pro defense, the defense is, is trying to give them their best talking points to take that into the, into the deliberation room so that they can, they can try to convince everybody else to side with them. State is trying to do the same thing. So, you know, maybe, maybe the 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 snide remarks and that kind of stuff is helpful because they're already talking to their supporters anyway. Um, I don't like it though, personally. Um, Ikes, can you object during closing arguments? Yes, you can. And we actually saw that during during defense. Um, Kristen O, oh, having trouble with the entire cocaine charge, given that they aren't charging Sarah Z for tossing rounds. If jury feels the same, is that a form of nullification? Well, it's only a form of nullification if they say, if they all say, yes, we believe that beyond reasonable doubt that that was cocaine in the bag and that she, she hit it and that she was tampering, but we don't want her to win because of X, Y, Z. Um, or we don't want to convict her because, you know, Sarah wasn't charged with anything that would, that would be jury nullification because it's basically for, for some other reason, not related to the, to the actual evidence as to whether or not someone is, is guilty, um, that they, they, they change to not guilty for, 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 for one of those reasons. Uh, the G slide, wouldn't the fact that COVID protocols were ignored, that all safety protocols were disregarded. I don't know that you can necessarily make that assumption that 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 means that all safety protocols were were ignored and i don't think that we've we've seen any evidence in this case that suggests that dave Beatty, i'm sick of personal attacks against opposing counsel by carrie can she be investigated slash punished for her lack of respect i don't think technically, so i mean technically it's a it, it'd be a bar issue but practically no yeah it's it's that's not the kind of thing that they're going to be willing to put significant resources into generally speaking um however she can definitely be criticized publicly by a lot of people um, um, so I don't know if that ends up making a difference, but, um, also the G slide can carry statements about AB come back to bite her in the future cases. Um, I appreciate your, your play on words there with bite. Um, probably not because you can, you can make completely opposing, um, arguments in two separate cases. This is, it's going to be, it's going to have a completely different jury. It's going to have, uh, uh, completely, it's going to start from from fresh. So, so no, no. I mean, if, you're, if you're in the if you're in the federal system, you can make mutually inconsistent arguments in the same case. <laughs> yeah, because they allow mutually inconsistent pleading. So yeah, yeah, fun. yeah. So there you go. And she's not a witness, right? She's 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 not a witness, so she doesn't need to have consistent testimony. For example, 
Um, Howie K, does the defense get a redirect after the state does its redirect? So let me let me explain this really quick. I didn't really explain the procedure of this before we got into it, but so the the procedure for a closing argument is first the state does theirs, then defense does theirs, then state gets a rebuttal. So what? What, why is that? Why is it ordered like that in the first place? So state goes first because they are the ones with the burden of proof. So they have to, to prove their case. Defense gets to, so they, they're at a slight disadvantage because they have to go second. There's already been a narrative placed before the jury before they can go, but they have the luxury of being able to respond to every single thing that the state said in their argument. So state has a little bit of a disadvantage because they don't know what the defense is going to say. Technically, they probably have a good idea because of everything that's come out at trial. Um, so that's why they get a rebuttal so that they can they can respond to the things that the defense talked about in their closing argument. But it's limited. It's limited to what the defense talked about. They can't just like talk about anything they want to. Um, Joanne, question why didn't Reed's home get searched? I don't think they had any reason to because she she was she was on set. She was in a her home was in a completely different state. Um, than, than where the movie set was. Lara Kay, isn't he showing over and over again that she didn't do her job when he says she didn't know about the live bullets? I think what he's saying is she didn't know about the fact that there were live bullets on set, but his argument about, you know, his argument about like, about like how, how she couldn't have possibly known the, the whole foreseeability argument was, was lame in my opinion, because it's like, oh, of course she wouldn't have known that there were live rounds in the, in the gun if she didn't properly check it. Uh, like that's kind of the whole crux of the problem here. Um, Jeff Postman, where would you put reasonable doubt in terms of percentage of certainty? I've heard surveys of legal experts that put it anywhere from 90% to 99%. I don't know. I've never really thought of a, a percentage for reasonable doubt. It's it's more like it's more like would you be willing to hang your hat on it? I don't know. Kurt, do you do you have a, a response for that? Um, no, not really. But yeah, that's basically what the the framework i've heard i've often heard more like 95 to 99 percent as sort of the level of confidence um the one of the explanations i heard because they talk about using it in your most serious affairs and so one of the uh examples that's been used in the past is how sure do you need to be to get married to somebody because you know it's a pretty serious affair so how mm. how confident do you need to be about that to make that decision and so that's one analogy that you can look to I'm not sure how okay. good an analogy it is with the high divorce rate, though. But I was gonna say, like the number of people that go for shotgun weddings in Vegas. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know that I that I that I well, find maybe that, that to be a consistently maybe, accurate way yeah. of going about it. Maybe maybe, uh, maybe the reasonable man is not as reasonable as we've been trying to convince ourselves of all this time. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, let's see. And I didn't catch it in stream yard, so I won't be able to bring it up on screen, but, um, Mark Molina had a question. If evidence comes out in Alex case, how does Hannah, oh, how does Hannah have any rights? She doesn't, her case is over by then. Um, couldn't one argue that HDR negligently injured Mr. Souza, like involuntary battery or something. Is that a thing? Battery is an intentional act. Um, so, so no, that, I don't think that would, that would work. Um, all right, let's get back to Although Richard the, Barnes says, and I think he's probably right in practice, he says that you can tell the jury all they want, but at the end of the day, it's probably more like preponderance of the evidence in reality. If they mm -hmm. think it's more likely than not, they're probably going to convict you. He's probably more right than not. Hmm. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. All right. Let's get to the rebuttal. State's reply. Mexico, I guess. I'll begin while the gentlemen are setting up the uh, Elmo for me. Mm. Okay. Old school. Oops. Okay. Hannah didn't know there was a live round on set. I agree. <laughs> If Hannah knew there was a live round on set and she loaded it into a prop gun and it was used to kill Helena Hutchins, 
She wouldn't be charged with involuntary manslaughter. Maybe murder. She'd be charged with second degree murder. She'd be charged with first degree depraved mind murder. This is an involuntary manslaughter charge because she didn't know there were live rounds on set and the reason she didn't know was through her own negligence, her own recklessness, her own willful disregard for the safety of other people. That willful disregard, that lack of care for the safety of other people that you have seen throughout this trial. It is shocking. For Mr. Bowles to come up to this podium and say it wasn't foreseeable that Alec Baldwin was gonna go off script and pull the hammer and pull the trigger, he showed you a video of Alec Baldwin going off script. Alec Baldwin went <laughs> oh, off script. Hannah Gutierrez knew it. She was there. Oh man. Hannah Gutierrez knew point. Nice line. that Baldwin was loose. She knew it. Way to use the defense's closing argument in your favor. I mean, the one video that he finally shows in court, like he, he didn't, he, he was like so low tech in this whole thing. And I think it caused him some problems and with some impeachments on cross-examination. The one time he does, she was like, this is, this is, this is an example of him going off script. This is way before this even this, this major event happened. What are you talking about? I like people talk about her tone in, in this, in this sense. I can I kind of get her tone, her incredulity over that. I'm like, well, okay, she kind of makes sense actually. I'm liking it so far. Yeah. She didn't do anything about it even though it was her job. It was her job. It is her job to say to an A-list actor if in fact that's what you want to call him. <laughs> um, <laughs> the shade. Hey, you can't behave that way with those firearms. That is her job. That is what they pay her for. That is the job that she applied for. That is the job that she accepted. Foreseeability. You wanna talk about off script? Just remember those videos of the stuntman. That's not within the script. She was there. She watched it. She knew these people would go off script. You know she didn't check the rounds. If she checked the rounds, they wouldn't have been floating around that movie set the entire time, undetected. Give you everything we've got. You have absolutely everything we have. This law enforcement team and this team of prosecutors have reviewed thousands and thousands and thousands of photos and thousands of videos. We have interviewed countless people, many of whom you didn't even hear from. We can't stay here forever. You have absolutely everything you need. One of the amazingly shocking things about this case to me has always been, and it's to Detective Hancock's credit, a defense attorney with his own agenda, no question, comes to her and says, it's Seth Kinney, it's Seth Kinney, it's Seth Kinney. That's his job, okay? Let's make that clear, that's Mr. Bowles' job. He gets Hannah's dad to say, it's Seth Kinney, it's Seth Kinney, it's Seth Kinney. Rather than ignore them, she gets a search warrant. She took his speculative agenda, presented it to a judge, got a search warrant, and searched that man's property. And oh my heavens, what did they find? They found exactly what Thel Reed said they would find. They found live ammunition with semi-wad cutter projectiles. You have everything you have. You, you, you have everything we have. You have everything you will ever need to convict her. 
This is 100% foreseeable. Hannah Gutierrez is not a scapegoat. Hannah Gutierrez is not being treated as a scapegoat. Mr. Halls was charged criminally. To his credit, he took an early plea and he got the benefit of that. Mr. Baldwin has now been indicted. Everyone with criminal culpability has been criminally charged in this case. She's not being scapegoated. She is being treated like everyone else. She is not being given a break because she's a woman. She is not being given a break because she's young, because that's not how the law works. Real quick, Slick556, five, five, thanks for the super chat. Thinking back to yesterday when the expert was rambling on, I thought of the, sir, this is so <laughs> <this meme. laughs> Nice, nice. Let me just review my notes real quick. And as I promised you, I am going to try to speed this up for you. Please keep in mind, Mr. Bowles comes up to the podium and says, Sarah Zachary threw rounds away. She did. Obviously she did. She admitted it. She told law enforcement that she did it. And rather than try to prosecute her for tampering with evidence, for panicking and throwing some rounds away, she agreed to come in and testify. And her agreement is that she must testify truthfully. And she testified truthfully. You want to know why we don't have an inertia puller in evidence? Why we don't have a box of dummies that Ms. Gutierrez said she brought on set? She said she brought two boxes. We've only got one. You want to know why? Because she went to the prop truck on October 23rd, got access to it, took a bunch of gun belts and a couple of boxes. Your Honor, I don't object. You're getting your ass kicked, son. Okay. Um, Christina Kirshner, why is, why is prosecution getting a rebuttal in closing arguments? Is that normal? Yes, yes. This is this is what happens basically every single uh, case, whether it's civil or criminal. The, the 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 side that has the burden of proof goes first, and then they get a rebuttal so that they can respond to the 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 closing argument of the defense. So because if you go first, you don't you don't have the ability to respond to what they said, right? Because because you haven't heard them say what they were going to say yet. So it's it's limited in scope, limited in time, usually. Um, and it's, I mean, so far, she's been limiting it to responding to what he's been saying. So it's been entirely proper on that front. Where were we? No instructions, so he lost. She took stuff out of the prop truck. She took gun belts. You heard from Sarah Zachary that those were gun belts that she brought from another movie set that were already loaded with dummy rounds. Who knows what was in them? So I want to make sure that we understand what reasonable doubt means. Reasonable doubt means the doubt must be reasonable. It is not a reasonable doubt to cast suspicion on Brian Norvell. It is not a reasonable doubt to cast suspicion on Seth Kinney. All investigative leads were exhausted. He simply didn't do anything wrong. You want to talk about scapegoating? That's the guy that got scapegoated. Nice. Real quick, just because. Thanks for the super chat. I need Natasha Leone as Charlie from Poker Face to react to this and yell BS from the corner. Um, I censored myself, but yeah. Thank you. <laughs> the doubt must be reasonable. And I don't have to prove this case beyond all possible doubt. If that is what the law required, my heavens, we live in a world of infinite possibilities. The government would never be able to prove a case beyond all possible doubt. We'd have to have a video of absolutely everything that took place. It's not the standard and it doesn't have to be the standard. So 
when you're back there and you're talking about doubt, make sure it's a reasonable one under this set of circumstances. You know, Mr. Bowles says to you, these production outfitters were just from one day. That's right. All that happened in one day. Imagine what all the other days were like. Mm. That was one day. Mr. Balls is right. The crew didn't believe there were live rounds on set. They believed that she was going to do her job. They believed that she did her job. This isn't Seth Kinney's responsibility to inventory rounds, although he did it. That wasn't his responsibility. Rust Productions didn't provide all of the dummy rounds to the set of this movie. You know from her own statements she brought two boxes on herself. We're not living in an alternate reality. All right. Let's go through these. I'll go through them relatively quickly. When you all go back into the jury deliberation room, you will have your own copy. Uh, so you certainly will have a copy to reference. Um, these are some of the instructions that are important to us. Your verdict should not be uh, based on sympathy or prejudice. Sympathy or prejudice, huh? It's not showing on the screen. Oh. Oh, I see. There we go. Thank you, Mr. Lewis. So it can't be based on sympathy or prejudice. And for any of you who are feeling sympathetic because she is young and she is maybe inexperienced, although by her own statement to Detective Hancock, she would tell you she wasn't. You all are on this jury because during voir dire, you agreed to follow the law. And I will ask you to do it right now. If you had said during voir dire, I can't follow the law, I feel too sympathetic, you wouldn't be here. And if you can't follow the law, you can probably excuse yourselves. Okay, I'm not sure I would have said that. That's a little yeah, I don't, overly aggressive. I don't like that case. either. Can I? Can I literally leave? Is that an option? <laughs> I'm out. Ed. I'm going to skip that one. That's an easy one. You must not concern she yourselves the with first the consequences half. of your verdict. That is the law. That is the law that you agreed to follow. That is the law that you are required to follow. Hannah Gutierrez endangered the safety of another by, hand, by handling or using a firearm in a negligent manner. There can be absolutely no doubt. That happened. Hannah Gutierrez should have known of the danger involved by her actions. Yeah, she knew. This was completely foreseeable. She was trained in firearms. Yeah, that's She hard. knows what we all know. Guns can kill you. You got to be really careful. Yeah, that's it's her training. Her it? act caused the death of Helena Hutchins. Yeah, her her supposed expertise in this, which, you know, sh she herself said, you know, when she was in the interview with the police, like, yeah, like I've been around guns for like my whole life, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's just that's the thing that kind of gets her on this end because it's like she she should have known someone who's not familiar with firearms, maybe not. She should have known. 
You know, one of the funny things is when the Supreme Court was debating twelve A is the alternative Thank theory. I said one of the funny things is when the Supreme Court was debating Miranda, there was a lot of commentary from the legal commentary and, for that matter, the uh, law enforcement commentary. Whereas, like, we can't possibly infor inform people of their rights. If we did that, they'd be invoking these rights all the time. We'll never have an interrogation ever again. Didn't really work out that way. No. No, not at all. No. They just they just got better at figuring out how to how to maneuver uh, and put some pressure on people. And so let me explain to you that 12 and 12A are alternatives. You must find you must make a decision about guilt or innocence unanimously to the count, not to the alternatives. So six of you can say, I think she's guilty of 12, but not 12A. Another six of you can say, we think she's guilty of 12A, but not 12. Done. You're done. Hannah Gutierrez loaded live ammunition into a firearm. Yes, she certainly did. She told the police she did. She failed to perform an adequate safety check of the ammunition. Of course, you know that. She didn't do it just once. She did it numerous times. She acted with willful disregard for the safety of others, without question. So you are being presented with what's called a lesser included offense. And I will remind you the instructions that the judge read you at the beginning. Um, your first job is to see if you can agree on involuntary manslaughter. If you find her guilty of involuntary manslaughter on either alternative, you do not move on to this misdemeanor. It's done. If you find her not guilty of involuntary manslaughter, then you get to move on to the misdemeanor. Kyle Mulkey, thanks for the super chat. She likes threatening everyone, the jury, Sarah Z. I don't know if she likes it. I think it's just she just has that abrasive tone that sometimes when she says something that that in another tone could be fine, but she just doesn't know how to moderate herself in those moments, it seems like. You've heard a lot about that. I'll but I agree. It. That's not menacing. This is what we call a general criminal intent instruction. And I want to just make sure that you understand this instruction only applies to the tampering with evidence. It does not apply to the involuntary manslaughter because she is charged with negligent homicide, not intentional. Very importantly, are the proximate cause jury instructions. These jury instructions are what allows you to find Ms. Gutierrez guilty, even though Mr. Baldwin may have also been a significant cause of the death of Helena Hutchins. So let's go through it. The death was a foreseeable result of Hannah Gutierrez placing a live round into a firearm. Of course it was. <laughs> the act of the defendant was a significant cause of the death of Helena Hutchins. The defendant's act was a significant cause of death if it was an act which, in a natural and continuous chain of events, uninterrupted by an outside event, resulted in the death and without which the death would not have occurred. Um, really quick, Ian, so forth. Thanks for the super chat. I'd like to hear her give a wedding toast. <laughs> oh man, I don't know. Carrie Morrissey, two or three drinks in, 
What kind of a wedding toast do you think she gives, Kurt? I don't know, man. Wouldn't be my first choice. <laughs> Agreed. She brought a bunch of live rounds on set, accidentally, but negligently. She loaded one of them into a prop gun, and this was after they were loaded into Jensen Ackles' gun belt and, and Alec Baldwin's too funny. holster. And she told Dave Halls, this is a cold gun. He told the crew, it's a cold gun. At that point, everyone certainly assumed that there wasn't a live round. She knew Baldwin would go off script. She didn't have prop duties to tend to. She walked out. And even if she had been there, it wouldn't have made a difference because you have seen the incredible lack of control that she exercised as the only person on the movie set in charge of firearms. There is no intervening event. If you think the intervening event is that Baldwin manipulated the gun, that was that's the whole purpose of the prop. He's going to manipulate it. You saw a bunch of other actors do it. Very importantly, there may be more than one significant cause of death. If the acts of two or more persons significantly contribute to the cause of death, each act is a significant cause of death. If you think Baldwin's act was a significant cause of death, that's okay. You can still convict her. Jury instruction 20. If you find the, neglig the negligence of a person other than the defendant was the only significant cause of death or constitutes an intervening cause that breaks the foreseeable chain of events, the defendant is not guilty. Yeah, it's hard to find that. Well, that's not this case. She brought the live rounds on set. She put a live round in a prop gun. That's the reason that Ms. Hutchins is dead. One of at least two reasons. That was a reference to Alec Baldwin. One of at least two reasons. The other reason is because... I will Baldwin again thank you very much for your time it. and for your attention. I know that this has been hard work for you folks. Um, I will ask you to find Ms. Gutierrez guilty of involuntary manslaughter <clears throat> and tampering with evidence. And I will ask you to bring some justice to Helena Hutchins. Thank you. Well, other yeah, than the fact remember. that she was yelling right, at me you. a little bit, I was pretty good. Instruction number 22, I will now ask you to retire to the jury room to begin your deliberations. You will be provided a copy of the jury instructions and the exhibits introduced as evidence will be made available to you. Prior to beginning your deliberations, you will need to select one of you to act as four person. That person will preside over your deliberations and will speak for the jury here in court. Forms of verdict have been prepared for your use. New poll incoming. You will take these forms to the jury room when you have reached a unanimous agreement as to your verdict. A four person will sign the forms which express your verdict. You will then return all forms of verdict, these instructions and any exhibits to the courtroom. There are 12 that deliberate. There are four alternates on this jury given the long uh, length of this jury. Uh, keeping with the privacy, I'm going to pass this instruction um, down with uh, the help of Ryan. You're gonna look if this is one of your names and you are one of the alternates. What I'm going to ask um, the bailiff to do is to first take the alternates out so they can get their belongings. And I'm going to ask you to meet me down at the end of the hallway to ex explain, 
I hate to tell alternates they're alternates because they've been paying so close to the evidence. Um, and so uh, just to talk talk with you and then um, and thank you. And then right along um, on your right on your clip will be um, the jurors themselves. OK, and the jurors will go into into the room. So I'll need the aid of both of them. But first, let me pass this piece of paper over to you. Look down here. There's four names. See if one of them is yours and you're an alternate. It's a very weird way of doing it. It's like, why not just say the jury numbers or something? I, I don't quite. All right. Yeah. Kurt, how long do you think this is going to take for deliberations? Let's see. They're an hour behind me. So they're, what's, 136 the right bottom. now? Um, uh, yeah. I think they'll be done by tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah, I can see that. Depending on the jury's desire, they could very well finish tonight if the judge lets them go late. Yeah. I mean, but based on based on 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 the differing opinions in in this chat, if that's any kind of a representation, of of how people are are thinking on the jury it could very well hang my prediction is conviction you think so yeah i just don't i i just find the arguments from the defense in the end unduly speculative and i i think alec baldwin has more interesting arguments for yeah. being able to reasonably rely on yeah professionals, for example, to show that he wasn't willful because he was reasonably relying on professionals as he has his entire career. So his defenses are much more interesting. But I, my prediction is Gil, she'll be convicted. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't know. I don't know because then, then with, with Baldwin, I mean, you've got the Screen Actors Guild guidelines, which are supposed mm -hmm. to be followed, you know, which, I mean, who knows if anybody actually looks at those, but still technically supposed to follow them you've got you know other people who have who have spoken out about you know uh, about this case in reaction to it like you know i talked about george clooney which people can have opinions about george clooney um i've never met him in person so i don't know what he's like as a person um but you know he he spoke out on a podcast like within days of this happening and was like absolutely this should never have happened i'm always checking the firearm in front of me every single time like so um so yeah, I don't know. I mean, I feel like it, his right, experience so, on on, uh, on sets can also follow the um, the alternates follow Ryan. I'll meet you down at the, in the hallway after you get your belongings, and then you'll follow with the jury. So I mean, his his experience could also cut against him because of all of the the instruction that he's had from previous armors. Yeah. You know, saying you're never, don't that's ever who, point this at anything. You know, that's what I bring as a state's witness. I definitely bring an armor or two from previous sets to show that, like, yeah, we've gotten this instruction a couple times. Yeah. Yeah. Like, this is not what I trained him on. I'm not like, saying that there's not good arguments to convict. I'm just saying that yeah. I think he has more interesting arguments to acquit. I think it's a more yeah. interesting case. Yeah. I, well, I think, I think they're, they're both interesting in, in, in different ways. I'm, I'm very, I'm very, very interested to see what, what comes of, of his case as well. So we'll definitely be streaming that one in oh, July, yeah, assuming sure. it doesn't get pushed back. I'm excited about that. All right, we're in recess. I'll be back in, but um, we're in recess. You can get going with your exhibits and things like that. Okay. All yeah. right. I do appreciate the defense lawyer's attempt to string together the evidence given what he had to work with i was yeah personally somewhat i was personally impressed by his closing and i was like you know this is a lawyer that i would happily hire myself because i think he did a really good job oh uh, i even what I, he had to work with i mean you know he's bound he's bound by the facts i mean there's only so much he can do i think he did for, i think he did a good job well I don't know. So there, there were there were a lot of there were a lot of a lot of things that I really took issue with. I mean, his his lack of follow through on impeachments, 
um, every single time when like I thought he was going to pull out a receipt to impeach someone and then the the the, the witness would give him like the opposite an answer of what, what's good for him and then he'd be like, oh, okay. And then he just looks incompetent, right? Like he just, he just looks like he doesn't know what's going on and the witness is telling him uh, rather than it should have been the other way around. Um, I should have so, been more specific in my, in my, I should have been more specific. I meant with respect to the closing specifically, I thought he was ah. really good. I wasn't trying to speak more globally. So my, my statement was in art, in artful. <laughs> well, okay. That's, that's fair. That's fair. The, the, his closing argument. Yes. I agree that it was, it was as good as the evidence was going to, to get him probably. Yes. So um, let's get some more questions here. Uh, Debbie Faze Uncooked, do you think we'll have a verdict today? I don't know. It's, it's possible. I mean, it's, it's 1.30, 1.40 yeah. p.m. Mountain Time. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, yeah. I'm... If they go late, if they go past dinner, I don't think uh, three and a half hours seems tight. But if they go yeah. past dinner, they could maybe yeah. do something tonight. Yeah, fair, fair. Um, Jerry Roth, the guy behind Bowles in the red when Carrie said, you have everything you need. He shook his head no. Um, I missed that. I missed that. But that, that's that's interesting. Um, also, Jerry Roth, the way Carrie has acted and used her glasses has made me tune her out. Do you think the jury is the same way? They could be. Honestly, for me, it hasn't been as much of a distraction as it has been for other people that have been watching. Um, and it could also be that, like, we're just focusing in on who's in frame. But, like, when you're part of the jury, you're sitting there, you've got a view of, like, the whole courtroom. It might not be as, like, big a movement as it otherwise looks to us because we just see her. We don't, we don't see the stuff that's going on around her, if that makes any sense. Um, let's see here. Uh, Brittany Chanel, Lego Bites, Elaine or this lady? Okay, if I had to choose between being represented by Carrie Morrissey or Elaine, I would choose Carrie Morrissey hands down, without a doubt. Uh, like, yeah, no 100%. hesitation whatsoever. 100%. Tone is one thing, but like, she is a zealous advocate and she's competent. She is very competent at her, at her job. Like there are some things that I criticize here and there, of course, but overall, like yeah, I would I would hands down have Carrie Carrie Morrissey represent me over over Elaine. Um, John Long, shouldn't there be a third option hung for jury nullification because Carrie said they could just leave? No, no, no. <laughs> the the poll the poll is is on what you would personally vote if you were on the jury. So. Uh, <laughs> so yeah. Um, Joanne, what's the makeup of the jury? The jury is, so there were, there were, so there's 12 plus there were four alternates. The alternates have been dismissed. It was like about an even split between men and women. That's all I know though, in terms of like demographics. I think, um, I think it was like slightly more women than men, I think, but like only a little bit more, nothing, nothing crazy. Um, Ian so forth. Thanks for the super chat. Will this prosecutor have a bigger team versus Baldwin or is there a chance she could be crossing him? Cause I want to say that she will be crossing him because it's her and Lewis. It's the same, it's the same team on the prosecutor side, on the state side, um, that will be against Baldwin. So there's no way Lewis is going to be trusted with, um, with, with crossing Baldwin. Like, you know, Carrie Morris, who wants to be the one to do that. Um, so yeah, that's, what's going to happen. That's get ready for that. Uh, De major LDN, why dismiss the alternates before deliberation is finished? What if one of the remaining jurors now has to drop out? Um, the, the likelihood of that is pretty damn low. It would, it would literally have to be like a personal emergency. Um, I don't know. I've never, I've never seen that happen. I, the reason why is, I mean, you, you don't want to necessarily keep the alternates just sort of hanging out for nothing. It seems to be a court oh. by court thing and a state by state thing. I think some that's states true. keep them, some states don't. It's just that's true. How they roll. That's true. True. If I had the option, uh, I'd keep it on it too as a judge in a big case like this. Yeah, if I had the option, I'm definitely keeping them in a room somewhere. You guys figure it out. <laughs> yeah, that's right. In the written house, uh in the written house trial, the judge was like doing jeopardy with them or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. During deliberations, right? <laughs> play hangman wait no yeah 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 um yeah i remember i remember asking natalie wisco if like they if they played jeopardy with them and she was like no we weren't allowed to play 
<laughs> it was just it was just for the um, it was just for the for the alternate jurors. Um, Jeff Postman, it seemed like the defense suffered from a lack of trial prep more than anything. I, yeah, I think, I think that's part of it. Um, there also was the, was the tech issue between the two sides. Like it seemed like overall defense was just low tech in, in their approach to presenting evidence, which is fine, except for when you need to use the other side's evidence, because if they, if all of their evidence is digital, it's videos, it's digital photos, it's all of that kind of stuff. And you need to quickly use it for your cross-examination. I mean, either that or just have everything, everything set up so that you you can use all of that evidence. I don't know. It's just that that's put it on a VHS a, tape, go old school. That'd be fun. Yeah, I mean something. Put a projector up on the wall. <laughs> um, so yeah, I think I think that was that was another um another aspect of it that was just like a choice to go more low tech that kind of maybe bit them in the end um, for some parts. Patrick Masters Productions, uh, Bowles asked questions that he never had answers to. That's law 101. Yeah, that also that also was an issue. Slick you shouldn't five, ask five, questions you don't know the answer to unless you don't care about the answer. Well, that's true. <laughs> unless you don't care about the answer. And the whole point is, is to pose the question in front of the jury. That's yeah. the one exception. Um, slick five, five, six, how much influence does a New Mexico jury have on sentence firmly convinced she's guilty, but I think there's a lot of mitigating factors to reduce the sentence. Um, it sounds like sentencing has been totally bifurcated from, from what it sounds like to me. I think that the judge is probably going to be determining the sentencing. So that's not going to be it. I, I have seen some cases where they have it all together. Um, Ooh. jury, jury decides the verdict and then they go straight into sentencing. Um, and they, the jury then decides, um, Texas does it that way. Yeah. That's, that's where I saw it. That was in, in the, the love triangle murder case, the, the, um, uh, Texas V Caitlin Armstrong, that one. Um, and then they gave her 90 years in prison for, mm -hmm. for murder. Um, so but here, I think, I think, now I'm not 100% certain, but I think that the the sentencing is going to be done by the judge, in which case, that's that's all. It's the the jury has has no say over it. All right. Uh, John Long, Legal Bites, do you think defense losing co-counsel so early hurt them? He seemed like the tech guy. Um, yeah, I, I think that that also may have played a major factor because – he may have also been the one who was supposed to cross-examine the the lead investigator, for example. Um, the fact that Bowles was in that interview maybe means that he probably shouldn't have been the one to cross-examine that very same witness. Um, and yeah, that that absolutely could have. What happened to co-counsel? Uh, we don't know exactly what happened, but he requested to withdraw on like day three three maybe something like that day two day three early on early on and um the judge did not allow him to fully withdraw from the case he was he was ordered to sit at the defense counsel table which he didn't from then on so that was interesting but he also was ordered to not talk to the defendant his former client um per her request mm. i think based on the timing of it the timing could have been because of the, or sorry, based on the timing of it, the only thing that I can think of, which may be completely coincidental, is that this also was like right after the disclosure of her phone number and all of those text messages, um, which they had a protective order in place and and everything. The the state put that up on the screen, everybody saw it, and then of course she got doxxed from that. Um, I remember when it first happened, and. When I first saw the phone numbers, people in the chat were like, whoa, hey, doxing. And I remember being like, okay, but I'm assuming that they've changed their numbers by now and like it's fine. And then uh, shortly after that, when uh, when we when it became clear that they uh, did not do that, I was absolutely shocked. So then, then like the next day, um, the next day was was when he – requested to withdraw. So I don't know if he was responsible for that or not. Total coincidence, maybe, but the timing of it does line up. I thought you said the prosecutor was responsible for putting it up on screen. She was the one who put it up on screen, but they should have objected before she she published it. Um, they Because I think they had an opportunity to look at it and to see if, if there was any issue with it. 
they so they absolutely should have checked to see if if her personal information was on there. But she also the state also has has their own responsibility because there is a protective order in place. So um, did, did the yeah, prosecution just, get yelled at by the judge? No, the media did. Court TV did. They're not they're <laughs> not bound by the. Why is this the media's fault? It's not. It's not the judge. And then the judge was like, and then also like, you need to take, you need to take that out of the footage or whatever. Or you need to, you yeah, need that's to not, like, that's definitely not how that works. I know. It's live, I know. Baby. I was like, it's oh, live. this judge does not understand live stream. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, the, the two attorneys absolutely like the, or the two, two, the two, uh, legal teams absolutely should have been reprimanded for that. Um, also, Peter Wyatt, thank you so much for gifting five Legal Bites memberships. Very kind and generous of you. Patrick Masters Productions, DS, Insightful Rhino, Decibel Kaus, and Wolves in France. You have all been gifted memberships by Peter Wyatt. So welcome or welcome back to Bite Club. Very, very kind of you, Peter. Thank you so much. Okay, let's see here. Uh, the G slide. Will AB be required to testify? He will not be required to testify, even even at his own, um, even at his own uh, trial, because he he can invoke his rights under the Fifth Amendment, similar to what Hannah Gutierrez Reed did. So, um, but do I think he might testify? I think there's more of a chance of him testifying than Hannah Gutierrez testifying. And that's because Alec Baldwin is Alec Baldwin. And I don't think he can help himself. And I don't think he's the kind of person to listen to counsel like Hannah is like, like she's, she, I, like, I, I, I think that, that since she got counsel, she listened to them. She followed their directions. I think, I think that that is uh, apparent in her, her wardrobe, her change of her, her hairstyle, all that kind of stuff that was way toned down in comparison to probably how she prefers to express herself when she's not in a situation like this. Um, so my impression is that she listens to her counsel. I've never had that impression about Alec Baldwin. What do you probably think? Do you think he'll testify? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You think so? Why? For every reason you just said. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Good answer. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, Tafka Day, going back to the beginning, if you were HGR or her lawyer, would you choose to go to trial or take a plea deal? Plea deal. 100%. Um, I'm not sure that what kind of plea would be available. I mean... Of course, the state has to agree to a plea deal too. Um, I'm not sure if they what kind of offer was available. Yeah, I think I I had heard that she was offered a plea deal, but it was something about like you have to testify as to like where those live rounds came from or something like that, and it sounded a lot like you need to testify in a very specific kind of way um, or something like that. I don't know if that's true. I I haven't verified that, but that is something that I've heard. So I don't know. Yeah, to 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 king to uh tldr that i don't know for a fact if she was offered anything either or what ter what terms were there but if there was a, a a plea deal generally speaking that involved like okay you have to testify just don't tell me what specifically to testify um yeah i i would absolutely take a plea deal i mean especially i don't given know if i would under this circumstance if i were her because you're only facing 18 months on the worst possible case well, and so if you plead if you plead guilty to either charge, either one's a felony. They're both fourth degree felonies. But you so can, that's not you, great. But see, keep in mind that um, that uh, Halls, Dave Halls, was was charged with the same with the same crime, and mm -hmm. he ended up getting a plea deal, and he ended up with a misdemeanor. So you end up with with not having a felony on your record. If they'll let me plead to a misdemeanor, I'd think about it a lot harder. But if the plea deal was, you know, you plead guilty to the felony, but will like basically no jail time. I don't know. I might roll those dice. Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, Mountain Princess 207. Thank you so much for gifting five Legal Bites memberships. So kind and generous of you. Um, Cat Nest, Emily Perry, Kurt Goddard, Tom Corwine, Sarah Matty 14. You've all been gifted memberships by Mountain Princess 207. So welcome or welcome back to Bike Club. Very happy to have you guys here. All righty. Any other questions here that I may have missed? I don't think so. I've been trying to keep track, but this is, um, 
Oh, Suki London. Do you think that Hannah would have been better off going with an experienced public defender rather than a non-criminal attorney? Yeah, for sure. It's not a criminal lawyer. Okay. Well, that's that's what I've that's what that's what's been what's been passing around is that he this was his first criminal case, apparently. Okay. Uh, has O one? It had something to do with her disclosing who the live rounds belonged to or admitting they were hers. I don't know which one. Okay. Yeah, that sounds that sounds about right. <laughs> Brittany Chanel verdict is in just practicing. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah, we we definitely are are not uh, there yet. Tish, uh, MM on Monday, Menendez Mondays. Yes, we are we are back on for that because I I I don't imagine that this is going to be going into Monday. I I doubt that. I I can see the the half of today and then all of tomorrow. I can see it taking that long, but beyond that. I don't know. I don't think so. Um, Michael J. Kastner, how is removing Coke tampering? See, here's the thing. In the in the hearing before the trial, they made this whole argument. The state made this whole argument as to why that why the 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 evidence tampering charge should not be severed from the involuntary manslaughter charge, and they mm -hmm. said that it was because they, what they used as their linchpin was they were like, we will be putting on testimony from a witness who is going to testify that they were in her hotel room one, one of these nights um, during, during the overall production. And she had in the hotel room drugs and ammunition in the hotel room at the same time. And the judge was like, that's really, 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 really thin. But then she ultimately concluded that's thin, but that's enough to link this together between, you know, the, the tampering charge and the, the rust film set issue, because, you know, what they wanted to say is that the reason why she, why she tossed the drugs was because, you know, she had them maybe on her during, during like when she was on set, maybe she was doing drugs on set while she was, um, you know, while she was working and that impairment that caused an impairment that meant that she can't distinguish between dummy rounds and live rounds. Like that was, that was what it sounded like they were getting at, at the last hearing before trial. Um, but we're at the end of trial and we've, we've heard no testimony from a witness saying that, saying that they were in the hotel room with the ammunition and the, and the drugs at the same time. So it's interesting that the thing that they said, the testimony, the evidence that they said was like the reason why it was worthwhile bringing it in with this case was one thing. And then they didn't end up using it. I don't know that to me, that just felt that very pissed me off. That would piss me off as a judge. It's like, if you, cause you're making a representation, basically here's my offer of proof of testimony. I'm going to provide that is going to link this to prevent this from being severed. And I'm like, okay. And then you don't do it. I'd be su I'd be su super mad. I'd be screaming yeah. from the bench. I'd be like screaming down your throat. Yeah. I, I, I don't agree. lie yeah. to the tribunal. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it to me. Yeah, it does. It does feel pretty, pretty dishonest. Cause the thing is like, you know, how is that, evidence in this case when otherwise the all of the testimony about that incident about the you know her supposedly handing off the drugs to becca what's her name you know and and saying can you hold on to this for me please that didn't happen on set that happened at the hotel room at night afterwards yes the incident had happened but if it was on set then i could be like oh yeah that definitely sounds like you know it's it's very relevant to what's going on there um, but otherwise it's, Hey, they're going to be looking at me very closely. I happen to have this stuff on me. I don't want to get caught for this. You know, like I don't want to get in trouble for this thing because I know that this is illegal. You know what I mean? Yeah. So also if there wasn't cocaine on set, I mean, craft services is just laying down the, the job. No, huh? nothing. <laughs> <laughs> the g slide uh good points after all he did the prime time interview he will have a hard time not talking exactly exactly that's what i think all right let's get this poll out here in the open results uh okay 
post closing arguments, would you vote guilty or not guilty regarding involuntary manslaughter? Uh, guilty, 61%, not guilty, 38%. So interesting. We could end up with a hung jury. We could end up with guilty. We could end up with not guilty. I think probably more likely guilty or hung. But yeah. Um, let me write that down because I've been tracking all of these polls because I find it so fascinating. Okay. And then it looks like someone is trying to ask a question and maybe hit enter a little bit too soon. So I'll wait for that one. And then that might be, that might be the last one for the day before we, by end the way, the while, I, while I have you on stream, do you have any interest in joining me for a Supreme court react? I still have to do oral arguments for the second half of net choice for a free speech online. And I want to also do the merit briefs for Trump immunity. So I don't know if you want to join what me is, for that. What, but... What's the first one? So there, w this was the case dealing with the state of Texas and Florida, but they already had the, I already did the oral arguments for Florida. Um, Texas also passed a law that basically requires <laughs> social media to carry content they don't want to, social, uh, especially political. They can't discriminate essentially on political viewpoint. They require mm -hmm. them to cover that traffic. And... Uh, there was an art there was two arguments one for florida's version and one for texas so i did the oral argument for florida's and i still have to do the oral argument for texas next net choice versus paxton very interesting, interesting. stuff interesting um well let's let's talk offline about about okay. that um okay here's the question love bade me question please poll will ab eventually haul your, your gd right i did <laughs> yeah will we will we have a a full um uh um god what's the name of the movie i'm totally blanking right now with tom cruise um and uh that's 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 what this quote Gene is Hackman. from you know our uh alec and not alec baldwin few but, good uh, men thank you Try yes a few good men yeah, thank yeah. you thank you thank you d major um uh, yeah uh will we have a a, a few good men moment <laughs> um i don't know I, I i could i could see her poking and prodding him into it i don't know but we'll see um all right folks i think that is it for me for this stream thank you so much normally the the morning stream would would uh would go right into uh, the afternoon stream redirect right into it, but we don't have an afternoon stream set up just yet. Got a little bit of chaos behind the scenes. Um, so yeah, so keep an eye out for posts about the verdict coming back. I'm still going to be around. I'll still be watching to see if there's, if there's anything, any news on that as soon as we know, and they, they've got a feed up for it. Um, I, I'll, I'll set up a stream. We'll do it. And then we'll, we'll come back for it. So, um, I'll post it on all the socials, of course, as usual. Um, so Kurt, any final thoughts on, uh, on, no. on this case, on this trial? No, not in particular on this trial. I, I, I look forward to the Ak Baldwin one and it'll be interesting if she's convicted, they might try to offer her some sort of pl plea deal after the fact and sort of try to get her testimony against Alec Baldwin. So there's all kinds of interesting possibilities here that could emerge. So should be interesting to see how it all pans out. And I'm yeah. definitely looking forward to this thing with Alec Baldwin because uh, we're all jonesing for another Johnny Depp trial. And uh, this looks like that could be it. So good times. <laughs> could be, could be, could be. Um, Hang on a sec. Oh, sorry. And there's one more question before we go. Debbie, um, I'm confused about the difference between the charges, negligent handling of a firearm and involuntary manslaughter. How do you get to the lesser charge? So they have to, so the jury has to first vote not guilty on involuntary manslaughter. And then if they vote not guilty on that, then they, then they, they look at, um, at negligent, negligent handling of a, of a firearm. And then they decide whether, whether she's guilty or not guilty on that, but only if she's not guilty on, on involuntary manslaughter. And alternatively, if the jury finds her guilty of involuntary manslaughter, they don't ever look at negligent handling of a firearm because it's assumed that, the, that involuntary manslaughter using a firearm involves some sort of negligent handling of a firearm. Mm -hmm. So, um, I hope that, I hope that, that uh clears it up for you sorry for missing that earlier um 
and that's about it. Cool. Okay. Well, I had fun. Uh, check out my channel, and we'll be discussing some of those Supreme Court oral arguments in yes. the near future. So that should be fun, and uh, we'll see how it goes. Yes, and I'm I'm about to update um, the description below so that you guys can have a direct link to Uncivil Law's channel. Go and check him out. He's got all kinds of great stuff, especially Supreme Court kind of stuff, which is awesome. I don't usually talk about the Supreme Court here, um, but you cover it a lot, which is awesome. Um, so... So yeah, that'll be updated in just a second. And um, all right. Well, thanks, Kurt. Thanks for joining me. This is great. All right. Bye -bye. Okay. All right, guys. I'll see you guys in the 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 next stream in the in the jury verdict stream. Right. Uh, I'll keep you guys posted.